Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Following his family's disownment of him and realizing that he had few prospects, Antoine Leblanc immigrated from France to the United States in April of 1833. Instead of shopping around for work in Europe – this was pre-internet, unfortunately – Leblanc decided to get a fresh start in a new country. He began by seeking his fortune in the land of promises. Through a German vessel, Leblanc arrived in New York. He quickly found work in Morristown, New Jersey after a mere three days of searching, and he started working on Samuel Sayers' family farm as a hired hand. As was all too common at the time, his labor did not earn him wages – he was compensated with room and board in the Sayers house's basement. The Sayers – Samuel and Sarah – both handed LeBlanc orders. So did their servant, Phoebe, who was probably a slave and served to further bruise LeBlanc's ego. LeBlanc was accustomed to a more relaxed lifestyle – maybe not the kind where he lived in the Palace of Versailles, but certainly one where he was not expected to chop wood and feed livestock per the orders of a servant. So you're probably wondering, why on earth am I talking about this? And how is it so simultaneously depressing and boring? He sounds like every other immigrant story, and he either eventually lived a normal life, died at a young age, or lived as a pauper before he discovered oil or started a new business. Here's the thing. Instead of doing the normal thing any person would have done, like looking for other work before quitting – it's not like the guy needed references in 1833 – LeBlanc plotted revenge. And he couldn't even do that normally. He could have stolen silverware or burned down a stable, but he decided that murder was the easier choice. LeBlanc suffered through two hard weeks before he finally snapped. On May 11th, LeBlanc returned to the farm after spending his evening drinking at a tavern. He feigned panic and he lured Samuel Sayre to the stable under the guise of there being a problem with the horses. When Samuel Sayre reached the barn, LeBlanc bashed his head in with a shovel. Samuel Sayre's head erupted with brain matter, with some of it dripping down LeBlanc's coat. Using the same technique of troubled horses, LeBlanc tricked Sarah Sayre down into the barn. He also smashed Sarah Sayre's head in with a shovel, but likely delivered the killing blow with a kick, taking advantage of the full force behind his heavy boots. Satisfied with his handiwork, LeBlanc dragged the bodies and hid them under a manure pile. He then sauntered back to the main house. He discovered that Phoebe was sleeping in her bedroom. LeBlanc took the twisted opportunity and beat her head in with either an axe or a club. Giddy, LeBlanc grabbed a couple of pillowcases and proceeded to stuff them with whatever prized possessions and cash he could find, and more importantly, carry. 
Once he had his fill, he stole one of the Sayre's horses and left the scene. Given that he had just murdered three people and the corrupted adrenaline probably splintered his attention span, LeBlanc did not notice that some of his stolen items had fallen out of a pillowcase. They not only roused suspicion, but they helped to distinguish his path. The morning after the murders, Lewis Halsey, a family friend of the Sayers, noticed items in the road that carried Samuel Sayers' monogram. Fear swallowed him, and he convinced a group of townspeople to help him investigate. Once the three bodies were discovered, Sheriff George Ludlow began to pursue the murder. LeBlanc had decided to relax at the Mosquito Tavern in Hackensack Meadows. He was drinking cider and, just like all dumb criminals, had his bag of loot sitting right next to him. Ludlow found him here. While he probably should have just played it cool, LeBlanc shot out of the tavern's back door the moment he noticed Ludlow. Ludlow caught up with him and arrested him on the spot. LeBlanc was dragged back to Morristown, where he was prosecuted. In his jail cell confession, LeBlanc admitted that he was at the tavern so he could rest on his way to New York and that he planned on sailing for Germany as soon as he could. His trial began in Morris County Courthouse, in courtroom number one, on August 13, 1833. Although LeBlanc was provided a fair trial, it was not enough for the grisly nature of his crimes. The jury reached their decision in 20 minutes, and they found LeBlanc guilty of murdering Samuel and Sarah Sayer. Unfortunately, as a slave, his third victim, Phoebe, was not considered important enough for LeBlanc to be charged with her murder. After LeBlanc toiled in his jail cell for the night, Judge Gabriel Ford delivered his sentence the following morning. He announced that LeBlanc was to be hanged. Incidentally, LeBlanc was the last person to be publicly hanged in New Jersey, and once he was dead, his body would be given to Dr. Isaac Canfield for the means of dissection. On September 6, 1833, LeBlanc climbed up the gallows. At the time, Morristown only had a population of roughly 2,500 people, yet somewhere between 10 and 12,000 people showed up to watch the public hanging. People even brought packed lunches for the event. The more curious or perhaps morbid people scaled trees and rooftops to get a better look. LeBlanc was subjected to a newer version of hanging. Instead of the floor dropping out from beneath him, he was projected eight feet into the air. Reportedly, LeBlanc twitched for around two minutes before he stopped moving. But the story doesn't end there. No, it's just beginning. LeBlanc's body was promptly cut down and taken to Dr. Canfield's nearby office. While Judge Ford said that Dr. Canfield was going to conduct an autopsy, that wasn't exactly what happened. Dr. Canfield and Dr. Joseph Henry decided to use LeBlanc's body as their own personal subject for tests that were too inhumane for living subjects and too disrespectful for the corpses of average citizens. One of their tests included linking LeBlanc's body to a power source after working to expose his nerves in an effort to test the theory that they could jolt a person back to life with electricity. While the test was largely a failure, they recorded that they managed to get LeBlanc's eyes to roll in the back of his head, make his limbs tense tightly, and force what looked like a ghost of a smile on his face. Once both doctors were finished using LeBlanc, his face was cast in plaster for the sole purpose of creating a death mask. Following that, LeBlanc's body was literally skinned. His skin was sent to the Atno Tannery on Washington Street. And here's what might be the creepiest part. The tannery crafted LeBlanc's skin into leather goods, wallets, purses, lampshades, and book jackets, all of which people actually purchased and used. Additionally, thin strips of LeBlanc's skin were peddled on the street. They carried Sheriff Ludlow's signature as a mark of authenticity. 
the items were popular and it is reported that many of them still lie in homes across Morristown even today. For a while, this entire episode, which feels like it was pulled from an over-the-top no-sleep thread, was more or less swept under the rug by Morristown's citizens. However, this forced ignorance did not last forever. Stories were spun about LeBlanc, and to invoke the late and great Mark Twain, the reports of his death were greatly exaggerated. One of the more famous stories concerned the final resting place of LeBlanc's skeleton. A popular rumor stated that Dr. Canfield hung LeBlanc's skeleton in his office. This was disproven in 1893, however. During the construction of an addition to the county clerk's office, a group of construction workers found themselves deep within the older building. They discovered a small wooden box that contained LeBlanc's bones. Fast forward to 1995, Halloween night. Dawson's auctioneers and appraisers of Morris Plains were working to liquidate the late Carl Scherzer's estate. While they were going through items in the basement, someone stumbled upon a fateful box. They opened it and they pulled out none other than LeBlanc's death mask. Not long after the death mask was discovered, another person was perusing the library upstairs. During their inspection for items, they found a shriveled change purse that appeared to be made of human skin. It was. Scherzer had spent his life working as a surveyor and his free time as something of an unofficial historian for Morristown. Throughout his life, he had collected quite a number of items from the century prior. Scherzer passed away in 1979, leaving the task of settling his estate and his apparent collection of LeBlanc memorabilia to his son, Douglas Scherzer, who eventually called Dawson's for help. The discovered items were placed in a display case at Dawson's for a time, but were never up for auction, despite the enormous crowd they drew during the November 18th auction. Even in death, or perhaps especially in death, LeBlanc really has a thing for getting people's attention. After their run at Dawson's, they were returned to Douglas Scherzer. Reportedly, the death mask is still in relatively good condition, although unnerving once you realize that LeBlanc's ears were cut off to make it, and it's tagged with the following information. Antoine LeBlanc, a Frenchman, murdered Judge Sayre and family, hanged in Morristown, New Jersey, 1833. The wallet, on the other hand, has not fared as well. According to Weird New Jersey, who were able to view the items after receiving a special invitation, the wallet has turned sickly greenish-brown. The texture is unsettling, as it is unlike cow or pig leather or even lizard skin. It is much thinner and is cracked. According to Morristown Green, following the item's relatively brief stay with Douglas Scherzer, they were given to the North Jersey History and Genealogy Center a few years ago. The Sayre House was converted into a number of restaurants over the years, with names like the Wedgwood Inn and Society Hill. It was even called Phoebe's at one point, if you can believe it. Servers reported several scares. This not only included the fact that Phoebe's bedroom could never be heated properly, but they would sometimes see her reflection in the mirror, feel cold hands press on their shoulders, and one person even described that they watched a bloody hand reach out from a painting. It was widely known that even after all of the candles and lights were snuffed out, the staff would always spot a candle or two still lit once they were outside. Perhaps the most terrifying moment was when the restaurant changed names and owners in 1991. On opening night, the punch bowl split apart in front of multiple witnesses. It has been theorized that the technical injustice Phoebe received as LeBlanc was never actually charged with her murder, may have led to her unrest in the afterlife. Although naming a restaurant after a person who was murdered in that very same building is more than a little inappropriate. The Sayers and Phoebe are all buried in the Presbyterian Church's cemetery in Morristown, and their house is now a bank. 
LeBlanc's remains will never truly be uncovered, as so much of him is scattered throughout Morristown. Although skinning a person and distributing leather goods made from their skin would never be acceptable now, it does make you think about how different and darker things used to be. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Living in the Czech Republic, it's not difficult to collect ghost stories from the country, and I can tell you it is a country full of tales, myths, and legends. There are many ghost stories about Prague, of course. Whether these are true, half-truths for the tourist, or even just a myth, they can be very entertaining. Here is an example. A Turkish man is said to haunt Tinsky Devur Prague, the story behind his haunting is as follows. He became engaged to a pretty young Czech woman and then returned to his homeland to ask his parents' permission to marry her. As the Turk was gone for quite a long time, his fiance, hearing nothing of him, began to believe that he had died or that he had simply forgotten about her. When the Turk finally returned to Prague, he found that the young woman had just been married and was celebrating with her family. She disappeared that night, and her decapitated body was found later. The ghost of the Turk now offers passers-by a glimpse into the box that he holds haunting the courtyard. Visitors should be warned that the box contains the young woman's freshly severed head. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to see this strange document firsthand, as it was on display outside of Brno. In fact, what I saw was a copy of the original. Nonetheless, the effect was chilling. The Devil's Bible, or Codex Gigas, is 36 inches tall by 20 inches wide and about 9 inches thick. It contains a set of Christian texts, including the Bible. It's bound in leather with metal trim and weighs over 165 pounds. It's known for the amazing color illustration in its pages of the devil, and that is how it gained its name. Historians believe the text was created in the Benedictine monastery of Podlazice in the Czech Republic in the early 13th century. Now, as if the scale of the Bible wasn't enough, the Bible's creation legend is even more bizarre. A monk in the Middle Ages who, after breaking his monastic vows, was sentenced to the horribly cruel death of being walled up alive is said to have written it. Desperate to avoid his fate, the monk promised to write, in just a single night, a book that both glorified his church and also contained all human knowledge. His plan was accepted, but by midnight he was nowhere near completing the book. He decided he needed help, but instead of praying to God, he prayed to Lucifer, offering his soul in return for the finished book. The devil responded to the monk's prayer, accepting the offer. Within seconds, the huge book was completed, while the monk added the portrait of his mentor and savior in gratitude, 
although some say Lucifer himself painted the picture. Experts agree that one person wrote the entire book and estimated it would take more than five years to complete, at least without supernatural help anyway. There have regularly been reports of ghost planes in Derbyshire, England. The reports are concentrated to an area in the Peak District of northern Derbyshire. This area has been dubbed the UK's Bermuda Triangle. Why is the Peak District so strange? Are magnetic anomalies detected in the local rocks responsible? Peak District of Derbyshire is a ghost-like graveyard covered with many wartime planes such as the Wellington Bomber, B-29 Bomber, Dakota, and Lancaster. Except for the remains of wrecks of planes, many witnesses also claimed to sight aircraft flying towards them before it disappeared completely. People have identified the plane as a Douglas Dakota, once flown by the RAF. Based on documents dated to the 1990s, a Dakota did crash in the area some 90 years ago. Local military and airport officials said there were no air shows or historical plane flyovers in the area. There are very few of these planes left, and even fewer are operational, so their flights would be well known. The old Dakota and Hercules aircraft do occasionally fly down the valley through Darley Dale towards Matlock, but they can be heard and their sound is quite distinctive. One of the eyewitnesses recalling a sighting of a Rowley ghost plane spotted over Derbyshire said, My son and I were driving along the A6 towards Rowsley from Darley Dale. Suddenly, in front of us was an aircraft flying very low towards us, so low we thought it would crash into us, but then it banked sideways and disappeared. We could not identify the aircraft other than it was old because it happened so quickly and left us quite shocked. Apparently, the crashes of military aircraft have continued over the years on the dark peak, generally due to dramatic weather conditions, as experts say. Peak District is an isolated area of the High Moorlands. Many wrecks, untouched and often witnessed by hikers present in these remote places of Derbyshire, seem to confirm the sightings of a low-flying propeller-driven plane which suddenly appears to be in difficulty before finally crashing into the moors. There have been at least 50 plane crashes in the area of the Dark Peak, and more than 300 people have lost their lives in these crashes. Many of the crashes remain unexplained, Unfortunately, an investigation into magnetic anomalies detected in the area did not help to shed light on the mystery of the Dark Peak. Naturally occurring magnetic rocks in the Dark Peak obviously can cause local deflections of compass direction, but no more than any other similar area. Air crashes cannot be related to these anomalies. On March 24, 1997, yet another sighting of a propeller-driven plane being witnessed flying low above the moors. The aircraft had difficulties to fly and suddenly disappeared, seemingly crashing on moors above Sheffield. A rescue operation involving 100 volunteers and police was launched, but failed to find any trace of a plane or crash. This is a story of the very strange goings-on with my 1992 Cadillac DeVille. A few months ago, I'd finally saved enough money to buy myself a car after going two years without one. It wasn't a lot of money, so I started my search on Craigslist. I would search Craigslist a few times a day, trying to find something in my price range. After about a week and a half, I came across a 1992 Cadillac DeVille that looked as if it just came off the production line, and the price on it blew my mind – $500 or best offer. Now, me being a Cadillac lover, 
I wanted to call this person and say, here's $500 cash, I don't care what's wrong with it, it's beautiful. But my gut was telling me it had to be a scam. So I called the number listed and asked the man a few questions about the car. He told me the car was so cheap because it was an old funeral procession car, the car that leads the hearse in a funeral procession, and the funeral home had bought new cars for the duty and had no more use for it. Intrigued by that, I set up a viewing and test drive for the next morning. The next morning rolled around and I met the little old man who I had talked to the day before. The car was as beautiful as the picture on Craigslist, and it ran beautifully. I told the little old man I'd take it, and we completed the paperwork. I was still in disbelief that I had got such a good car for so cheap. A few weeks passed, and the car was still running great, but I started to notice odd things. For example, every morning when I got in my car, it smelled like a fresh-smoked cigarette. Being a smoker myself, I kindly shrugged it off, but then weirder things started happening. One night I was looking out my living room window and noticed that the dome light in my car was on. Not wanting my battery to die, I went out and shut it off, thinking I'd left it on by mistake. I got back to my apartment and when I passed my living room window I noticed the dome light was on again. So I went back down to turn it off. After doing so, I stood next to my car for a few minutes to make sure the light was really off. When I got back to my apartment, I looked out my window for a third time, only to find the dome light on yet again. Irritated, I went downstairs a third time and turned off the light. I waited 15 minutes and the light stayed off. Before I got back upstairs, I yelled, are you finally done for the night? It's getting old. And directly behind me, I heard a giggle. I spun around to see who was laughing at me, knowing how crazy I probably looked screaming at an empty car. I started thinking someone was screwing with me, but no one was around. A little creeped out, I went inside and looked out my window to see if the light was back on. It wasn't, so I went to bed. Odd things like this kept happening. One morning, I went down to my car only to find the stuff from my glove compartment all over my car and the car smelling like a fresh-smoked cigarette. It freaked me out. I went over all possibilities and ruled out a break-in, so I decided to pretend it didn't happen. Odd things kept happening over the next few weeks. One day, I was driving in silence when the radio started blasting a station I don't really listen to. It scared the crap out of me, so I turned the radio off, but it quickly came back on. I freaked out and pulled over into a Kmart parking lot. I turned the radio and the car off and wandered around Kmart for an hour or so. When I returned, my car again smelled like a fresh-smoked cigarette. A few weeks passed, and nothing happened, so I figured maybe the weird things were over. Nope. One night I was sitting in my apartment with a friend when she asked who was sitting in my car. I jumped up and ran to the window and, sure enough, there was a figure in the driver's seat. I grabbed a baseball bat and ran downstairs with my friend in tow. When we got outside, there was no one in the car. I checked, but the doors were still locked. My friend and I checked the parking lot, trying to find an explanation, but we came up with nothing. Fed up with all this, I called the funeral home the next day and spoke to the man who sold me the car. I asked him if anything horrible had happened with that particular car. He was a little taken back by the question so I told him the strange things that had been happening. The man then said that the car was usually driven by the funeral home's best and most senior employee who had recently passed away. He proceeded to tell me how well this woman had taken care of the car, almost as if it were her own. I then asked if this woman had been a smoker. He said yes. I knew right then and there that she was behind the mysterious events. 
Since then, strange little things have happened with the car, like the hazards coming on when the car was unmanned, the smell of cigarette smoke, things being scattered throughout the vehicle, the radio coming on, the locks freaking out, and me feeling soft touches, that kind of thing. So, all in all, I think this lady is just not ready to accept the fact that she's passed on and that I own the car now. In January of 2013, Elisa Lam, a 21-year-old Canadian student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, embarked on a solo trip around the west coast of the United States. Her intention was to visit San Diego, then work her way up through Los Angeles, Santa Cruz, and finally San Francisco. And she wrote extensively about her plans on social media sites such as Tumblr and Facebook, as well as her own blog. She traveled alone, using trains and buses to creep from one destination to the next. And all in all, it seemed like a rather exciting adventure for the young lady. During the first leg of her West Coast tour, as she liked to call it, Lamb regularly contacted friends and family, as well as posted photos online of herself in various locations, such as the San Diego Zoo. And she finally arrived in Los Angeles on January 26th. Lamb checked into the Cecil Hotel, a modest budget hotel located just a few blocks from the infamous downtrodden Skid Row area of Los Angeles. At this point, things were already beginning to take a turn for the spooky, as Lamb was originally intended to share a room with others, but was moved to her own room when the roommates complained of her certain odd behavior. Then on January 31st, 2013, Elisa Lamb simply disappeared. Social media posts abruptly stopped, and Lamb's daily correspondence with her parents inexplicably ceased. A search was organized, and Lamb's parents flew out to Los Angeles to help with the search efforts as well, and the disappearance would be widely reported in the news, yet no evidence was found and no one was sure of what had become of Elisa. The police had the entire hotel searched from top to bottom as much as was possible, as well as the roof, and dogs were also used to go through the roof and each floor, but they were unable to pick up any trail of lamb, and nothing was found at the time. It was as if she had stepped off the face of the earth. There were only a few scant clues turned up. Hotel staff reported that Lamb had been alone that day but seemingly in good spirits, and a nearby bookstore employee claims that Lamb came in shopping there and that she had been lively and very friendly. Other than that, there was nothing. Increasingly frustrated authorities began posting flyers around the area imploring people to come forward with the missing woman's whereabouts, and in the meantime came forth with what would be the first bizarre piece of the puzzle of one of the weirdest unsolved deaths in recent memory in the form of a curious, creepy piece of elevator surveillance video footage, which seems to be the last time anyone saw Lamb alive. The footage is bizarre, to say the least. In the video, Lamb can be seen entering the elevator wearing a red zippered hooded sweatshirt over a gray t-shirt, as well as black shorts and sandals. Her behavior is decidedly odd and erratic right from the start. After getting onto the elevator, she frantically presses some of the elevator buttons, but nothing happens and the elevator doors don't shut. She seems agitated about something and also weary as if someone is following her. When the elevator doors fail to close, she peeks outside of the door several times, looks both ways, and then quickly moves to the wall of the elevator and cowers out of sight as she keeps her eyes fixed towards the outside hallway. She also cautiously exits the elevator and seems to playfully hop before stepping back into the elevator and then out again. The whole time, her hands are in her pockets. She then steps almost out of sight around the corner 
and pulls her hands out of her pockets to put them up to her ears before stepping back into the elevator and frantically pushing buttons again, seemingly to methodically push them in a line up and down the panel. She paces about and puts her hands up to her ears and goes out of the elevator again as if expecting someone. At this point, she can clearly be seen talking to someone who is off camera, as well as making a series of strange gestures, rubbing her forearms together, moving her hands and twisting them about in strange, almost arcane-looking movements and gesticulations, wringing her hands together and weaving her arms out to her sides with fingers outstretched, as she also seems to bow and rock back and forth slightly. It should be noted that the elevator doors remain open this entire time. Lamb then walks to the left and off camera. After a few moments, the doors of the elevator finally do close, almost as if on cue. And this is the last time anyone saw her alive. The strange, rather disturbing video immediately went viral as soon as it was released, with its spooky, unsettling imagery and almost horror movie-like quality. What was the meaning of Lamb's odd behavior and gestures, and why didn't the elevator doors close the whole time until after she had stepped off camera for good, as if intentionally timed that way? In light of the mysterious disappearance, a lot of theories made the rounds at the time. One was that she was trying to escape some unseen pursuer who was following her, which would explain her clearly evasive behavior and apparent desire to hide. Another was that she was high on some kind of party drug such as ecstasy. It would later become known that Lamb had long suffered from depression and bipolar personality disorder and that maybe she was having some sort of breakdown or psychotic episode in the footage. No one knew. Indeed, we still don't. But the video would take an even more urgent, sinister quality when coupled with the gruesome discovery that would be made not long after. A few weeks after Lamb's strange disappearance, hotel residents began to complain of low water pressure and strange-tasting discolored water, and on February 19, 2013, a worker was sent to check out the hotel's water tanks, which lie suspended 10 feet over a heavily secured area with alarm systems in place. When one of the water tanks was opened, inside was found the waterlogged corpse of Elisa Lamb, finally found nearly three weeks after she had mysteriously disappeared. She was completely nude, covered in a sand-like substance, with her clothes and belongings bobbing about in the murky water beside her. It was later determined that she had been floating about and decomposing in the fetid tank for weeks. This was very odd on its own, because the rooftop was fairly well secured with a myriad of alarm systems, none of which had been set off. Furthermore, the tank was in a difficult-to-reach spot, and there was no ladder at the scene, meaning that the slight 5'5", 120-pound Elisa Lamb would have had to have gruelingly hauled herself up to the tank, undress, and then plunge herself in along with her stuff. It seemed strange that she would have been able to get into the water tank to begin with, and no one could figure any of it out. Speculation and questions at the time raged. How could such a slight woman have managed to get past the security measures, drag herself up into the water tank, and then close the heavy door to lock herself in to drown? Why had she taken off her clothes, yet taken them with her into the tank? Did she do this on her own, or was this foul play? The strange circumstances in which Lamb's body was found would only propel the case further into the realms of the bizarre and the mysterious death began to draw around it a cloak of various strangeness and spooky synchronicity. First was that weird surveillance footage, which took on a new, menacing quality with the macabre discovery of the body. With the finding of the body, the odd elevator video footage was once again thrust into the limelight and subjected to intense scrutiny. 
For some, it merely showed a frustrated young woman trying to get the elevator to work, with the exiting, re-entering, and weird hand gestures merely a way to try and get the elevator's sensors to register her so the doors would close, and her agitation normal for someone having technical difficulties with a machine. However, if this is the case, then why does she clearly seem to be hiding from someone? And who is she talking to off-screen? Also, why does the door appear to work only after she has left, and not in the several minutes we see her on video? Another idea is that this was some sort of breakdown or episode related to her ongoing depression. Lamb had long been struggling with mental health issues, which she often lamented online in her blog, which had as its slogan the haunting quote by author Chuck Palahniuk, you're always haunted by the idea you're wasting your life. Lamb had been taking several different medications for her condition, including Welbutin and Lamistil, and seemed to be coping well for the most part, but at one point she claims that she had a relapse, although it is unclear what sort of relapse she is talking about. Her blog offers other clues to her mental condition as well. Her tone seems to fluctuate wildly from happy and outgoing to morose, brooding, and self-deprecating, depending on the day and sometimes even within the same post. She also mentions having been raped at one point, and the way she breaches the subject of her assault seems to be eerily detached, matter-of-fact, and peppered with dark humor. As for her actual trip to California, she seemed to be very upbeat and excited about that, often gushing to friends and family about all the places she planned on seeing. It is speculated that this depression and mental instability had spiraled into full-blown bipolar disorder and psychosis, and that Lamb ended up killing herself in a fit of madness. Perhaps she had gone off her medication and finally lost her grip on sanity, and what we see in the video is her finally losing her hold upon it. However, many friends and family have pointed out that she had been very happy and well-adjusted during her trip, and that she'd been looking forward to going back to school. She also mentions in one blog post that she's in love with someone. Although she had obvious mental health issues and was battling depression, and there was the matter of her original hotel roommates complaining that she was acting strangely, there don't seem to be any red flags that mark Lamb as being particularly suicidal throughout her blog posts in contact with her friends and family prior to and during her travels. Also, if it was a suicide, then again, how did she manage to get herself into the water tank? Access to the tank was very restricted, with various barricades barring entry and alarm systems that were later determined to have still been in perfect working order at the time of Lamb's death, yet they had not been set off. The water tank lid was also extremely heavy, being difficult for even one grown man to budge, let alone a slight woman like Lamb, making it seem highly unlikely she could have gotten into the tank on her own. By all accounts, the tank was intentionally difficult to access for the very purpose of keeping people from wandering in and contaminating the hotel's water supply. Indeed, the water tank was so difficult that authorities ended up cutting it open to reach the body. Even now, no one is quite sure exactly how Lamb had gotten to the roof and managed to get into the tank. There are other theories to Lamb's death as well. It has been suggested that she may have been under the influence of some sort of drug, yet this theory is hampered by the fact that toxicology reports turned up no signs of drugs or alcohol in her system and Lamb had absolutely no history of drug or alcohol abuse to begin with. The whole story of Lamb's autopsy report itself also has a rather sinister undercurrent. From when the body was found, it took four months and many delays before the report was finally released, even though it was originally announced that it would be released the week after her death. Additionally, authorities were strangely non-transparent evasive and uncooperative with press during the entire ordeal. In the end, it was officially announced that there had been no signs of trauma on the body and no evidence of foul play or drug overdose. 
Lamb's death was ruled an accidental drowning, and it was surmised that she had gone to the tank on her own, possibly in a mentally unstable state, and then either entered or could not get back out or jumped in to commit suicide. It was also speculated that the tank might have been full when she entered and that the water level had dropped through water use to the point where she could not have gotten out again even if she'd wanted to. So the question is, why did it take four months and numerous delays for authorities to come up with that? It seems like something that could have been determined rather quickly, so why all the major delays? Also, why were authorities so evasive and obscure about Lamb's death in general? Several residents of the fourth floor of the Cecil Hotel, where Lamb had been staying, later claimed that the police had not once interviewed them while the investigation was taking place. That certainly seems a bit odd, doesn't it? This has all caused some to consider that perhaps there was some sort of cover-up being perpetrated and that there is a conspiracy permeating the Lamb case. This has further been bolstered by claims that the elevator video footage has been tampered with and edited. Indeed, it has been pointed out by some astute amateur sleuths that the original full video appears to have been discreetly replaced with a shorter version, missing an entire minute of footage, and that some parts appear to have been slowed down or changed in some way. There is indeed a time jump that cannot be seen in the video, which does seem odd. If any of that is true, then why was the video altered? Was it to hide something? And if so, what? No one really knows. Obviously, with all the facts concerning the difficulty in accessing the water tank, the bizarre surveillance video, the delayed autopsy report, and Lamb's mental state at the time, there are many who absolutely do not buy the official report, and the case only gets weirder from here. Another piece of evidence that has turned up is another piece of hotel surveillance footage that shows Lamb entering the building with two men under mysterious circumstances. One police detective on the case described the footage thus, We did see her come in with two gentlemen. She had, they had a box, gave it to her, she went up into her to the elevator. We never saw them again on video. This has led to the idea that perhaps these men had something to do with Lamb's demise. But there was no hard evidence to that effect, and the footage remains merely an odd curiosity. The main piece of evidence is overwhelmingly the final elevator footage of Lamb, and of course the extremely odd behavior displayed in the video has led to ideas that Lamb was not suffering from a mental breakdown at all, but was rather in thrall to some supernatural force or trying to escape from one. This is where things take a turn from inexplicable and odd into downright bizarre territory, as such a far-out supernatural explanation doesn't seem so incredibly absurd in light of the Cecil Hotel's rather dark and ominous history. The Cecil Hotel originally started as a moderately upscale hotel in the 1920s for business clientele. But when the Great Depression hit in the 1930s, the area around the hotel deteriorated, and the hotel devolved into a cheap accommodation for a variety of riffraff, transients, and unsavory characters. Among the shady characters who came through the Cecil Hotel's doors were two of history's most notorious serial killers, Richard, the Night Stalker Ramirez, and Jack Unterwedger. Ramirez stayed in a room on the top floor of the hotel in 1985, at a time when he was very active, claiming 13 victims during his stay there. After his grim work, allegedly Ramirez would come back to the hotel to dump his bloodied clothes in the hotel dumpster and then enter through a back door. Unterwedger was an Australian serial killer who went on a murderous rampage across several countries, killing prostitutes, and he also stayed at the Cecil Hotel in 1991, during which time he killed three prostitutes in the Los Angeles area, Shannon Exley, Irene Rodriguez, and Sherry Ann Long, who he beat, sexually assaulted, and strangled with their own bras. Authorities believe that Unterwedger chose the Cecil Hotel specifically 
because Ramirez had stayed there. There was also a long history of numerous suicides at the Cecil Hotel, especially during the 1950s and 60s when it was a popular spot for people to end their own lives by jumping from the windows of the upper floors. In one instance, a Pauline Auten, 27 years old, hurled herself out of the ninth floor window and landed on a passerby, George Giannini, 65 years old. Both were killed instantly. In addition to all of these suicides was the murder of one of the hotel's residents, a Pigeon Goldie Osgood, so nicknamed because he often fed the pigeons at a nearby park. On June 4, 1964, he was found dead in his hotel room after having been beaten, raped, stabbed, and strangled. Not necessarily in that order. No perpetrator was ever found, and his murder remains unsolved to this day. Another famous rumor is that the Cecil Hotel was one of the last places where Elizabeth Short, otherwise known as the Black Dahlia, stayed before her grisly unsolved murder in 1947, although L.A. crime historian Kim Cooper has said that Short in fact never stayed at the hotel and that this story is just a rumor. In her murder, Short was found dead in Leimert Park, Los Angeles, and had been drained of blood, cut in half at the waist, mutilated, and had a smile cut into her face with a knife. Although the horrific crime has never been solved, it is thought to have perhaps been a ritual killing. Considering this sinister history, it has been speculated that Lamb could have been under the influence of, or even full-on possessed by, some sort of malevolent supernatural force inhabiting the hotel. This could explain her erratic behavior on the final surveillance footage taken of her, as well as the fact that the elevator doors wouldn't close. Alternatively, she may have been trying to escape some entity that was stalking her through the halls. According to these theories, Lamb was eventually killed due to being in Thrall II, possessed by or captured by these forces, and that is how she was able to end up in the tank. Many have even claimed that if you look hard enough, you can see a shadow or ghostly form in the video. Of course, there is no concrete evidence really that there was any supernatural aspect to Lamb's death, but the strange video footage, the Cecil Hotel's menacing history, and the weird circumstances under which Lamb's body was found certainly make this a spooky theory to be sure. To top off all of this strangeness and talk of haunted or cursed hotels are the myriad strange coincidences and instances of synchronicity surrounding Lamb's death, to the point that it is hard to even know where to start. One such case concerns an outbreak of a drug-resistant form of tuberculosis that rampaged through the seedy nearby Skid Row area around the time of Lamb's death. In a chilling display of startling synchronicity, the field screening kit used by medical personnel during the outbreak was called the LAM ELISA test, or enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. Tuberculosis probably had nothing to do with LAM's death, but it must be noted that one of the drugs used to treat the disease, called Isoniazid, has the possible side effect of confusion and abnormal behavior. Whether TB had anything to do with Lamb's death or not, it's hard not to be at least a little spooked by these coincidences. Another coincidence that has made heavy rounds in the debate of Lamb's death is the similarity between this death and the 2002 Japanese horror movie Dark Water. In the film, a young girl dies when she falls into the water tank of a run-down apartment building while trying to retrieve her dropped bag. She drowns, and the water from the tank leaks down into the building below to haunt it with her spirit. The movie saw an American remake in 2005, which stars Jennifer Connelly and Dugray Scott. The American version further adds to the weird coincidences with two of the characters' names. In the film, one of the characters is named Dahlia, like the Black Dahlia said to have stayed at the hotel, and another character is named Cecilia, similar to the name Cecil Hotel. Both movies also contain scenes of mysteriously malfunctioning elevators. 
Is this all just weird coincidence, or is there anything more to it? Who knows? Other bits of weirdness that have come out of the woodwork as the video is relentlessly picked apart and studied is the sequence of buttons Lamb pushes in the elevator, which many observers agree seems to be the numbers 14, 10, 7, 4, B, and block hold, in that order. Several posters on forums on the matter claim that Lamb is playing an urban legend game called the Elevator Game that is supposedly popular in South Korea, in which a person is said to be able to travel to different dimensions if they follow a set of rules and an order of button pushing while riding an elevator. A perhaps even weirder theory is that these numbers correspond to the Bible's John chapter 4 and then verses 7, 10, and 14 of the New King James Version Bible which read as follows. John 4, 7 says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. John 4, 10 said, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. In John 4, verse 14, but whomever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Again, is this just simple coincidence? Or people reading too much into things? After all, people all over the internet have found amalgams of the name Elisa Lamb hiding in everything from the Bible to Greek tragedies and writings by Plato to works by the infamous mystic Aleister Crowley, but it seems that if one looks hard enough, they can find an amalgam to any name, in anything, and make whatever connection or assign any importance they want to it. Is there any meaning to these coincidences, or just the meaning people give them? Or is there really no such thing as true coincidence, and real meaning is to be found buried here if one is able to find it? One last strange little mystery to the case of Elisa Lamb is that her Tumblr account continued to post pictures up to six months after she died, and there was an update to her blog after her death as well. While certainly creepy, authorities have speculated that this is probably just because she had set up her account to automatically post images for a given amount of time. Whether that's the case or not, it is still definitely an eerie detail. The Elisa Lamb case has become one of the most haunting, debated, and intensely picked apart mysterious deaths in recent memory, and for good reason. What brought this young woman with such a promising future to this hotel? What happened to her in that video footage? Are we looking at a woman having a psychotic breakdown or is there something more ominous and malevolent going on? Was her death a suicide? A murder? or something even more mysterious? How did she find herself in that water tank, and why? And what of all the disturbing coincidences and unsettling synchronicity orbiting her death? Just what in the world happened to Elisa Lamb? These are questions that we will likely never know the answers to, and Elisa Lamb's bizarre death will probably remain forever mysterious and unresolved to any satisfactory degree. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book 1 is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, 
Suspense, Possession, and More. Dark Intrigues Book 1 by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book 1 on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. A strange, unidentified, humanoid creature has been spotted near Mount Vernon just outside the nation's capital. Has one of Washington, D.C.'s reptilian swamp creatures crawled out of her office for a bit of sightseeing during the congressional summer recess? The sighting reportedly occurred a couple miles north of Mount Vernon. Despite its name, Mount Vernon is not a mountain. It is the former plantation home of George Washington, situated on the Potomac River. Today, Mount Vernon is an independently owned historical attraction. On July 31st, a motorist driving near Mount Vernon spotted what appeared to be a deer by the side of the road, until it stood up and ran across the road. MUFON Ohio investigator Ron McGlone received a report of the sighting recently, which was published by the Mount Vernon News. The witness is described as credible and requested to remain anonymous. Whoever they are, the eyewitness says the creature ran out of a cornfield and across the highway at a tremendous rate of speed, crossing the highway in only a few steps. According to the witness, a creature appeared to stand seven to eight feet tall, hairless with light brown skin, and possessing a tall, slender body, arms and legs in small diameter, hands and feet looking oversized for its body proportion, small neck with oval, elongated head. The witness also said that the humanoid figure had large, black, oval-shaped eyes similar to everyone's favorite gray aliens. As it stands now, this is a lone, unsubstantiated sighting. The Knox County Sheriff's Department has not reported any other sightings from the same area on the same dates. Might this merely have been a wildlife encounter? With the speed which full-grown male deer can run, it could be easy to mistake one for something else if it ran quickly in front of your car. Then again, who knows what it might have been. The Washington, D.C. area attracts all sorts of strange visitors, after all. Could one of our reptilian alien overlords have gotten a bit too carried away and gotten separated from their tour group? Probably not. We all know reptilian aliens aren't really the ones in charge, after all, right? Another type of terrifyingly vile creature is the spineless, soulless corporate shill hiding inside a suit and person mask. They typically aren't seen in their true form unless you've got a pair of those sunglasses from They Live. My brother was dating a witch. I know, it's a strange way to start a story, but it's true. She was into witchcraft and other pagan practices, if my memory serves me correctly. You see, I was a teenager, I'm now nearly 30 years old, and this story still rings vividly in my mind. He's my older brother, there are nearly nine years between us. Despite this age difference and our very different lifestyles, I still looked up to him. His stint in the Marines was a difficult time for me and my parents, long periods of time without contact with him. A base in Japan was his home for a year before he returned to the States. In all of this, I'm thankful to God that he never saw combat. After his military career ended, he returned home and lived with my parents and I for some time while trying to get his footing without the Marine Corps planning his days and paying his bills. It could have been months or years that he was home when this girl shows up in his life. I wish I could remember dates, but those are the parts that stuck with me. I met her a few times. I think she even met my parents. She was a beautiful girl in her 20s with dark black hair and caramel-colored skin. 
As a teenage boy, fear was definitely not my first reaction to seeing her. My brother was often willing to tell me of his exploits, probably basking in the idea that his little brother wanted to hear them and would soak up every word. One day he told me about his girlfriend's uh, extracurricular activities. He never went into great detail about all of her practices as a witch. I'm not sure he knew all of them, but one event he told me stuck out. They were hanging out with some friends one night, likely drinking and partaking in other libations, when she decided to get out a Ouija board for some entertainment. My brother was no stranger to the dangers and stories surrounding this game, as my family and I are devout Christians and we denounce such practices. Obviously, my brother no longer shared this view, or he just didn't care. They began to play the game. It's at this point that I should stop to mention that this girl he was dating was of Mexican descent. Not that her ethnicity would normally be important for a story like this, but this case is different. They placed their hands on the planchette and began speaking to the board. Her goal was to contact her deceased grandfather. She later described him as a mean old man, he was a racist old codger, and he apparently didn't hide it. They received some feedback from the game board, but nothing remarkable. Later that night, after they put the game away, my brother went to sleep. Suddenly, he awoke to terrible pain in his stomach. He was sure he wasn't drinking so much that it had made him sick, but he figured to be safe he'd better head to the bathroom. All he remembers after that is waking up with his face on the bathroom floor, pants around his feet, and an excruciating pain in his stomach. He had never felt this before. It wasn't nausea or anything that normal intestinal complications would cause. He knew this pain. His time spent in combat training allowed for an education on what the source was. This awful pain was identical to the pain you get from being punched square in the gut. An ache accompanied by difficulty breathing, like the wind was knocked out of him. Bending over to see his abdomen, he sees a red mark formed directly over the source of the pain. He composed himself as the pain subsided, cleaned up, and went to tell his girlfriend what happened. Early that morning, after telling her the story, she decided to get the Ouija board back out. Her suspicions were confirmed when they addressed her dead grandfather again. Grandpa, was that you that attacked my boyfriend in the bathroom? Did you punch him in the stomach? The planchette moved. Yes, it said. She then asks, why would you attack him? The planchette moves again, this time spelling out two words, white boy. I guess my brother told me this story for another reason. I think he wanted to break the news to me that he had broken up with her. It wasn't over this Ouija board incident, though. He explained that shortly before returning to my parents' house, he had been in a fight with his girlfriend. They were arguing with one another, escalating their voices and frequency of strong verbiage, when she picks up a knife and lunges at him, trying to kill him. Providence and some keen military training allowed him to evade her murder attempt. I don't know how much her witchcraft played into those two incidents, but the third is what convinced me that they were all linked. Before the Ouija board and before the murder attempt, I was experiencing strange things in the house. They actually became so frequent and occurred in such clear pattern, I was able to make predictions by these events. For example, one day I'm alone at home and I hear one of the support beams in our basement gong. We had a finished basement and I spent a lot of time down there. We would often stub our toes or bang our knees on this metal beam, each time sending a gong sound throughout the entire house. This time was no different, except I was home by myself. I locked the basement door. I didn't want to know what that was. The very next day, my brother came home. He would spend two or three weeks away from home, never calling or getting in touch with my parents. We had no way of knowing where he was or when he was coming home. He would come home, stay for a few days, and then disappear again. The next incident was when I was sleeping. I didn't even know it happened until my mom told me about it after I got home from school the next afternoon. She said I was sleepwalking and apparently stood in their bedroom doorway just staring at them. 
She asked me what was wrong and I turned around and went back to bed. This wouldn't be strange normally. I do have a few sleep disorders, but this time was different because my brother came home the same day that she was telling me about my sleepwalking. I began to get suspicious that something was wrong, but I wasn't sure what. The next time it happened, I was home with my mom and she was in the other room. I was watching TV in the living room. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the gong of the support beam in the basement again. Only this time it was followed by the sound of someone running up the stairs. I hustled into the room my mom was in and asked if she heard it. She had but thought that it was me down there. It was at this point I told her what I had experienced before, along with these events seemingly being correlated with my brother's sporadic returns. She didn't believe that these two things had to do with anything. Until the next day. You see, I told her that my brother would return that next day. And he did. She believes me now. I only made the connection to my brother's witchcraft-practicing girlfriend when he told me about his two frightening experiences when he returned, just as I predicted. In June 1891, two young men from Washington, D.C., Edward A. Ned Hannigan and Thornton J. Tony Haynes, traveled to Fort Monroe on the Virginia Peninsula for a few days of recreation. They were close friends. Both were young men of high social standing from prominent military and political families. Tony Haynes was the son of Colonel Peter C. Haynes of the Army Engineer Corps and the brother of Lieutenant John P. Haynes, 3rd Artillery, both stationed at Fort Monroe. Ned Hannigan was the grandson of former Indiana Senator Edward Hannigan and, on his mother's side, General Thomas Nelson, who had served as minister to Chile and minister to Mexico. The two men went boating the afternoon of June 12th in Chesapeake Bay in an open boat described as a 28-foot canoe. The boat had sails, but the day was calm. Hannigan was rowing and Haynes sculling. They were about 150 feet from shore when a storm began to roll in. Several witnesses on shore were watching the boat, wondering if it would make it to shore before the squall. They seemed to be working at cross-purposes, with Hannigan trying to row them into shore and Haynes continuing to scull them out. A witness heard one of them say, I don't care if we get inside. Haynes suddenly turned and fired two shots at Hannigan in quick succession. Hannigan fell slowly back into the boat, then raised himself up with his arm on the gunwale. Witnesses heard him say, help, help, on the shore there, this man has shot and killed me, or some variation of those words. Those watching from shore did not believe it at first and thought Haynes and Hannigan were just pulling a prank. But when Haynes brought the boat in, he surrendered himself to the fort commander. Hannigan had been shot through the heart. Haynes claimed that he had fired in self-defense. He said that Hannigan had raised his oar to him and felt his life was threatened. Several witnesses had seen the shooting from the shore, though. Only one saw Hannigan raise his oar. Questions were raised as to why Haynes would take a revolver to go rowing and why would he fire it twice if it was self-defense. The murder trial of Thornton Haynes that September drew huge crowds partly because Senator Daniel W. Voorhees of Indiana, known to be a great orator, would be assisting the defense, also because women, who reportedly made up at least half of the crowd, were fascinated by Tony Haynes. Oratory on both sides of the case was strong and impassioned, but when the jury returned after four hours of deliberation, they found Haynes not guilty. Whatever it was that swayed the jury in Haynes' trial did not sway society around Fort Monroe. Some of the officers were aloof to the family while others continued their relations with the colonel and his wife but refused to recognize the son in any way. Mrs. Haynes' aggressive attempts to reestablish her son in society gradually alienated all of her formerly sympathetic friends. Tony Haynes was so upset at being shunned by the fort that he sent a letter to the Secretary of War proposing that the ostracizing and slights toward his family be stopped. He added that if nothing were done officially, he would take the matter into his own hands and put an end to it himself. 
Reportedly, the Secretary of War forwarded that letter to the President, who handed the matter to the Secret Service. They stationed an agent near the House who diligently shadowed Tony Haynes. Eventually, the Secretary of War showed the letter to Colonel Haynes. The Colonel assured the Secretary that the letter had been written without his knowledge and added that he had been forced to the melancholy conclusion that his son was insane. Colonel Haynes requested a transfer and was reassigned to Portland, Maine. Lieutenant John P. Haynes also requested a transfer and was sent to Fort McHenry, Baltimore. Tony Haynes reportedly left on his own for South America. In our brightly lit cities and cozy homes, the idea of ghosts might seem outlandish. But in the deep woods, miles from civilization, the paranormal seems far more possible. Do ghosts lurk deep within the wilderness? Here are five true ghost stories from park rangers and other outdoor workers that suggest spirits dwell where the living do not. Flying Boulders When I was doing trail clearing, there was a lot of strange stuff. One night I was camped by a lake, miles from even the nearest road, when a boulder just flew into the lake from the other side. Then another, then another. The boulders looked to be several hundred pounds and the lake exploded when they hit. They looked wider and taller than me, six foot one. I didn't really sleep that night, but my hatchet and K-Bar were my cuddle buddies. Jerked Around This happened in the desert of Utah. I was a wilderness guide and lived out of my truck, so I camped nearly every night. I was totally used to weird noises, twigs cracking, whatever. One night it was extremely calm and quiet, but there was a weird vibe in the air. A couple friends and I were on BLM land in Utah near Moab, and we had just put out the fire and laid our bags out. Just as I was starting to fade out, something grabbed me by my wrist and jerked my arms straight up into the air. I sat up immediately, and two of my friends bolted up at the same time. It happened to all of us, and we couldn't explain it. Nothing else happened, but still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I think about it. The Screaming Woman I'm a wildland firefighter with the U.S. Forest Service. This story is from an old supervisor of mine that I believe completely. The setting is 2004 or so in the Hell's Canyon area of Middle Idaho. My supervisor's crew had been working all day and were going to be working through the night as well. An assistant superintendent, he was out scouting ahead on an ATV. He was working his way down a logging road that had clearly not been used in some time when a bobcat appeared in the middle of the road. The thing stood there for a good ten seconds, screamed at him, and then scampered up a nearby tree. He found this odd but not particularly unsettling. Half a mile or so down the road, he found a small cabin. This was also odd, as he was working on federal land and no private structures should have been there. Upon investigation, he saw that all the windows had been boarded shut. The doorknob had been punched out and secured to a hole drilled into the log frame by a chain. Someone did not want anything getting in or out of that cabin. Unsettled, he hopped on his ATV and headed back up the road, where the bobcat had been he found a Native American woman in a badly tattered nightgown. He yelled at her and asked if she needed help. She just screamed at him, the same scream as the cat, and climbed up the tree faster than any human had a right to. Obviously, my supervisor got out of there as fast as he could, unsure of who or what he had seen. He asked a local guy about the cabin. A local Native American heard them talking and said, my supervisor had seen a skinwalker. Paying their respect. I was a staunch non believer in ghosts until I saw. We were driving down a rural Kentucky road with a full car load when all of a sudden the driver turned off the radio and all the guys removed their hats. Everyone was dead quiet. I tried to ask what was going on and got shushed. About a mile ahead, the radio and hats were put back on and everyone behaved normally again. I then asked what was going on. They told me a child had died on that stretch of road 
and will haunt people that don't respect it when they drive through. I was like, yeah, right, they're just trying to scare me. On the way back, the guys in the car did not turn off the radio or remove their hats, so I believed my suspicions of trickery were correct. That is, until I began to feel a dampness on the knees of my pants. I asked if anyone else was experiencing the same thing, and while they weren't, they did notice two small child-sized handprints on the rear window. I would have thought they were planted except the expressions on my friends' faces told me otherwise. When we got to our destination, the handprints were still there, along with two perfect feet marks in the condensation on the back of the car. A Winter Apparition For about two years, I worked as an instructor at a therapeutic wilderness program in Western North Carolina. I was in charge of at-risk youth, and my job included all the responsibilities and nuances associated with that. Shifts ran 16 days straight, on the clock 24-7 at that time, and all spent backpacking. My second winter there, I was with the group at our primitive base camp. It was basically a collection of different yurt camps on the grounds of an old Christian camp. It had just snowed that evening, and a fresh blanket had covered camp in the hours since we laid down for bed. At about 1 a.m., a student woke me to go pee. I was required to stay awake until he got back. He did his duty, then returned to the yurt. There's somebody out there, he whispered nonchalantly. Huh? I said. I saw a guy up on the fire pit just now. Dude in a flannel shirt just standing there. I got up and looked out the yurt window. Nothing. I figure he was probably just out of it, and we went back to sleep. About an hour or so later, I had to pee. I slipped my camp shoes on and walked outside the yurt. Upon returning, I glanced over to the fire pit and saw a man standing there in the moonlight looking at me. It was so bright I could see the plaid pattern on the flannel. I immediately went for my brand new high-powered hand light and cast 900 lumens at him. He vanished before the beam hit him, just gone. I woke up a co-instructor and we searched the camp to make sure another group didn't have a run in progress or something like that, but there was nobody. Even more unsettling than that, there's not a single footprint in the fresh snow around camp. Many times throughout history, the American legal system has allowed cases where penalties were imposed on individuals for murder where no act of homicide was actually carried out by the accused. While this typically has to do with those who are wrongly accused of a crime, there are some instances that fall outside what might be deemed ordinary. One controversial incident in recent years involved four teenagers from Elkhart, a town north of Indianapolis, Indiana, who, while attempting to burglarize a home they thought was empty, were fired on by a homeowner sleeping upstairs. One of the four teens was shot and killed during the incident, and following the arrest and trial of the remaining three, each were convicted of murder and sentenced to five decades at a regional correctional facility. They may not have pulled the trigger, IndyStar.com reported of the incident, but as far as the law is concerned, the rash decision to try to score some cash turned them into murderers. Perhaps the only thing more unusual than a group of individuals being sentenced to murder despite having never committed an act of homicide would be when a dead person is accused of the crime instead. Boston Globe reports that a Baltimore police detective investigating the shooting death of a popular 19-year-old high school student wrote to top homicide commanders that she'd cracked the case. The detective, Jill Beauregard Navarro, had an unusual story to tell. The victim, Victorious Swift, was purportedly the target of an attempted robbery by 44-year-old Charles Frazier, who was attacked by the teenager. Swift, it turns out, was a boxer. In a panic, Frazier shot Swift and later told others in the community about what he had done. It would otherwise seem like a cold case closed, if not for one outstanding detail. Frazier, the accused, was also dead. His body, Boston Globe reports, was found within two months of Swift's killing, though not before he could be charged with the crime. 
the result had been a circumstance known in law enforcement as closed by exception, which entails reasons beyond the control of law enforcement preventing an arrest, despite there being ample evidence for charges and prosecution of a suspect. Hence, the Globe ran the story with the curious headline, Bodies on Bodies, Baltimore Police Increasingly Accusing the Dead of Murder. We aren't talking about zombies here, of course. Still, such circumstances raise interesting questions about the rights of the deceased and what can be done when a deceased individual is a suspect in a crime they committed while living. In many states, if an individual has passed away, law enforcement can release information about them, although certain states – Texas comes to mind here – may continue to withhold information from the public. Often, in cases where it is legal to release such information, there are authorization processes one must go through in order to obtain the deceased person's data. Things get stranger still, though, when the deceased individual is the one attempting to obtain recognition for their rights. Again, while this may sound like the kind of thing only a zombie could do, another interesting legal circumstance arose a number of years ago in Ohio that involved such a query. In Ohio, a law known as the Presumed Descendants Law allows for the presumption of the death of a person if the individual in question has 1. disappeared and hasn't been heard from for five years or more, 2. if they disappeared within five years but were exposed to a specific peril or death, or 3. if the individual was declared dead under the Federal Missing Persons Act as a result of having served in the armed forces. This law became problematic for Donald Eugene Miller Jr., who after meeting the aforementioned criteria was declared legally dead in 1994. Then, a number of years later when he appeared in court attempting to prove that he was, in fact, still alive, the judge in question, the same judge incidentally who presided over the previous determination of his death, now sat before Miller explaining that despite what appeared to be reasonable evidence of his existence after all these years, the law still maintained that he was, in fact, dead. A similar incident was reported more recently out of Romania, where 63-year-old Constantin Reliu was pronounced deceased by a court of law after having left his wife a number of years ago upon discovering that she had been unfaithful. Having broken all ties with the deceitful spouse, she eventually reported him missing and he was presumed dead after a number of years. During this time, Constantin had been working in Turkey but was eventually deported. Upon returning to Romania, he learned of his death and, despite appealing to judges, found similar difficulty to that of Donald Miller in convincing judges of his survival. The appeal period for contesting the declaration had passed, judges told him, and he was denied the appeal and therefore must apparently remain legally deceased. In such circumstances, one might expect that common sense would prevail over the law, but it's pretty obvious that's not always the case. In other words, sometimes it's hard to find justice for the dead, even while they are still among the living. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Well, I guess it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that 
After three years of hosting the Weird Darkness podcast, something paranormal or strange would eventually happen to me. And that's how I would describe last night. My bride and I sleep in separate bedrooms because early in our marriage I was working nights, she was working days, and we just could never get used to having someone else in the bed with us. Add to that my snoring, need for some noise in the background, and only a sheet with a ceiling fan, while Robin needs complete quiet and a dozen blankets, and you'll understand why we have the sleeping arrangements we have. But we still love each other immensely and visit each other a lot. It's only the actual sleeping that is in separate rooms. Ever since I got a CPAP machine a few years ago, Robin doesn't hear me snore, which is a good thing except that sometimes her mind gets away from her and suddenly she wonders if I've died and I'm no longer breathing so she'll occasionally look in on me to make sure my chest is going up and down. Typically, she does this in the early evening after I've already gone to bed and she's getting ready to do so herself, or if she's been up in the morning and I'm still sleeping for a long time, but she never does this in the middle of the night, at least not to my knowledge. Last night, I was sleeping as usual and heard my bedroom door slowly open, and I heard Robin slowly walk up to my bed and stand over me. I opened one of my eyes to confirm what I assumed and I saw her silhouette quietly standing over me. I assumed she was once again just checking on me as she had before, or perhaps she had a bad dream and just needed some comfort knowing that I was in the house. After a few moments, I began to question whether or not it was actually my bride in front of me that I was seeing. My room's extremely dark and there is no light coming in aside from a very small section above the window where my room darkening curtains don't cover. So it was only a faint outline of Robin that I was seeing, or thought I was seeing. I sensed this may not be Robin, so instead of acknowledging her presence in my room by saying, I love you, I just stayed quiet and pretended to sleep. There was no way she could have seen my one eye open in the room, so I just kept watching for a few moments after a time I realized she wasn't moving at all. And then I began to wonder if my eyes were playing tricks on me and perhaps she wasn't in front of me at all. But I had heard my bedroom door open, hadn't I? I wasn't really sure of anything now, so I reached over to my phone to click on the lock screen for a little light to see in my room. When I did, nothing was there and my door was closed. I was, of course, startled at first, as I had been convinced something was there. I thought perhaps I just hadn't heard Robin leave the room, and it was too dark for me to really see her do so. So I rolled out of bed with my phone in hand, opened my bedroom door to look into the hallway, and I could see that Robin's doors were also closed, as usual. I listened outside of her room and could tell by her breathing that she was most definitely asleep. So now my one theory to what I saw had been negated. I took the opportunity while awake to go to the bathroom while clearing my head. I realized that I may have had a reaction to the new meds I was prescribed by my doctor earlier yesterday. He had upped my dosage to relieve my headaches and vertigo. While sitting in the bathroom, I did a quick search to see if possibly hallucinations could be a side effect of my medicine. And, while rare, it appeared that yes, that could be the case. Obviously, I don't like that as a possibility, but I accepted it and went back to bed, still a bit shaken. This morning, my bride was at the kitchen table doing her Bible study, and after talking for a while, I asked, Hey, baby, I don't think you did, but by chance, did you get up last night and come into my room to check on me, maybe around 1 a.m. or so? No, she answered. I was about to ask you the same thing. I lived in New Baden, Illinois, with my boyfriend and our four-year-old daughter. We lived in a green mobile home, haunted by a demonic entity. When we first got to the home, I saw something shoot down the hallway. I said, there's something in here with us, something not human. My boyfriend said I just needed to get used to the new surroundings. 
but I know what I saw. It was a black, human-shaped shadow, and it ran down the hall every time I took a shower. My daughter's closet was on the other side of the wall, and she saw him too. Every night I closed my daughter's closet door before she went to bed. Every morning I found it open. I said, baby, if you're afraid of the bad man in the closet, why do you open the door? She said, I don't. He does. She described the man as fat and red with funny-looking eyes. I drew several different types of eyes, and she picked a goat's eye as his. I froze inside. I didn't know what to do, so I yelled into her closet, You're brave enough to pick on a child, so come impress me! Well, it did. It floated a jar off my knick-knack shelf right in front of me. I said, okay, I'm impressed, now go away. It then showed itself to me. It was awful. I instantly felt sick and very scared. But I love God, and my faith is strong. I later went to my boyfriend's mother and she gave me a picture of Jesus and a picture of Mary that had been blessed by the church. I hung them in my daughter's bedroom and all the activity stopped. The term déjà vu is used to describe a feeling or impression that you have already witnessed or experienced a current situation. Coined in 1876 by the French philosopher Émile Boyhock, the term déjà vu means literally already seen. Most of us have experienced being in a new place and feeling certain that we've been there before, but we have difficulty understanding how it's possible. Although rather common, it still remains a little understood phenomenon. One of the most bizarre déjà vu cases ever recorded deals with a man who was trapped in an eternal time loop. This person experienced never-ending déjà vu, and his condition reached a stage when he avoided watching television, listening to the radio, and reading newspapers because he felt he had encountered it all before. The case of the unnamed British young man who experienced never-ending déjà vu for the last eight years of his life, intrigued scientists. Never before had anyone heard of a similar case. What could cause a person to be trapped in an eternal time loop? Doctors from the UK, France, and Canada examined the man who was 23 years old at the time. He first experienced the sensation in 2007, shortly after he started university. It soon became clear that the man did not exhibit any of the other neurological conditions usually associated with those who suffer from déjà vu. Dr. Chris Boylan, a cognitive neuropsychologist at the University of Bourgogne who worked on the study, says the man had a history of depression and anxiety and had once taken the drug LSD whilst at university but was otherwise completely healthy. This man was striking because he was young, otherwise aware, but completely traumatized by this constant sensation that his mind was playing tricks, he says. For minutes and sometimes even longer, the patient would feel that he was reliving experiences. He likened the frightening episodes to being in the psychological thriller film Donnie Darko. There was one instance where he went to get a haircut As he walked in, he got a feeling of déjà vu. Then he had déjà vu of the déjà vu. He couldn't think of anything else, says Dr. Moylan. Brain scans appeared normal, suggesting the cause was psychological rather than neurological. Whilst this case on its own does not prove a link between anxiety and déjà vu, it raises an interesting question for further study, Dr. Moylan says. Although many theories have been put forward as to what causes déjà vu, it still remains an unexplained condition. Déjà vu happens mostly to young people, but a number of older people have also reported the sensational feeling of seeing or experiencing something before. 
Dr. Akira O'Connor, a psychologist from the University of St. Andrews, believes that in most cases it is a momentary misfiring of neurons in the brain which creates false connections. One idea is that déjà vu is a sort of brain twitch. Just as we get muscle spasms or eye twitches, it could be that the bit of your brain which sends signals to do with familiarity and memory is firing out of turn, he says. Dr. O'Connor says this fits with evidence that déjà vu is more frequently experienced by people with epilepsy and dementia. Another theory developed by Professor Ann Cleary at Colorado State University is that déjà vu is the natural result of seeing something genuinely familiar in our surroundings, such as the shape of a structure or the layout of a room sparking a false memory. She developed a computerized virtual reality called déjà vu where people navigate around similar landscapes to test the hypothesis. But Dr. O'Connor says none of the current theories definitely solves the mystery of déjà vu, partly because its fleeting and spontaneous nature makes it almost impossible to reliably study in lab conditions. Methods of trying to induce déjà vu are pretty crude, he says. Yet another somewhat unorthodox explanation is that there is a hidden connection between déjà vu and the existence of parallel universes. The truth remains that déjà vu remains an unexplained mystery. It also remains unknown how many people suffer from the chronic version of déjà vu. One of my favorite haunted locations has always been the infamous Lemp Mansion in St. Louis, Missouri. Long regarded as one of the most haunted houses in America, the historic mansion was once home to the Lemp family, creators of an American brewing empire that was unlike any other for many years. Not long after visiting the old house for the first time, I began to realize that its reputation is well-deserved. The Lemp family came to prominence in the mid-1800s as one of the premier brewing families of St. Louis. For years, they were seen as the fiercest rival of Anheuser-Busch and the first makers of lager beer in America, but today they are largely forgotten, remembered more for the house they once built than for the beer they once brewed. That house stands as a fitting memorial to decadence, wealth, tragedy, and suicide. Perhaps for this reason there is a sadness that hangs over the place and an eerie feeling that has remained from its days of despair and abandonment. It has since been restored into a restaurant and inn, but the sorrow seems to remain. By day the mansion is a bustling restaurant filled with people and activity, but at night, after everyone is gone and the doors have been locked tight, something walks the halls of the Lemp Mansion. Are the ghosts here the restless spirits of the Lemp family, still unable to find rest? Quite possibly, for this unusual family was as haunted as their house is purported to be today. They were once one of the leading families in St. Louis, but all that would change and their eccentricities would eventually be their ruin. The story of the Lemp Brewing Empire began in 1836 when Johann Adam Lemp came to America from Germany. He had learned the brewer's trade as a young man, and when he came to St. Louis after spending two years in Cincinnati, he opened a small store and began selling dry goods, vinegar, and his own brand of beer. He soon closed the store and turned his attentions to a small factory that made strictly vinegar and beer. It is believed that during this period, Lemp introduced St. Louis to the first lager beer, a crisp, clean brew that required a few months of storage in a cool, dark place to obtain its unique flavor. This new beer was a great change from the English-type ales that had previously been popular and the lighter beer soon became a regional favorite. Business prospered, and by 1845 the popularity of the new beverage 
was enough to allow Lemp to discontinue vinegar production and concentrate on beer alone. His company expanded rapidly thanks to the demand for the new beer, and Lemp soon found that his factory was too small to handle both the production of the beer and the storage needed for the lagering process. He found a solution in a limestone cave that was just south of the city limits at the time. The cave had been recently discovered and its proximity to the Mississippi River would make it possible to cut ice during the winter and keep the cave cold all year round. Lemp purchased a lot over the entrance to the cave and then began excavating and enlarging it to make room for the wooden casks needed to store the beer. The remodeling was completed in 1845 and caused a stir in the city. Other brewers were looking for ways to model their brews after the Lemp lager beer, and soon these companies also began using the natural caves under the city to store beer and to open drinking establishments. The Lemp's own saloon added greatly to the early growth of the company. It was one of the largest around and served only Lemp beer and had no hard liquor. This policy served two purposes in that it added to beer sales and also created a wholesome atmosphere for families as beer was considered a healthy drink, especially to the growing number of German immigrants in the city. The Lemp Western Brewing Company continued to grow during the 1840s and by the 1850s was one of the largest in the city. Adam Lemp died on August 25, 1862, a very wealthy and distinguished man. The Western Brewery then came under the leadership of William Lemp, Adam's son, and it then entered its period of greatest prominence. William Lemp had been born in Germany in 1836, just before his parents came to America. He was educated at St. Louis University, and after graduation he joined his father at Western Brewery. At the outbreak of the Civil War, he enlisted in the 3rd Regiment of the United States Reserve Corps. Soon after leaving the military in 1861, he married Julia Feichert. The couple would have nine children together – Anna, William Jr., Louis, Charles, Frederick, Hilda, Edwin, Elsa, and an infant that died at birth in 1862. After the death of Adam Lemp, William began a major expansion of the Western Brewery. He purchased a five-block area around the storage house on Cherokee Street which was located above the Lagering Caves. There, he began the construction of a new brewery and by the 1870s, the Lemp factory was the largest in the entire city. By 1876, it was producing 61,000 barrels of beer each year. A bottling plant was added the following year and artificial refrigeration was added to the plant in 1878. This would be the first year that the brewery's production would reach over 100,000 barrels. By the middle of the 1890s, the Lemp Brewery was known all over America. They had earlier introduced the popular Falstaff beer, which is still brewed by another company today, although the familiar logo once had the same Lemp emblazoned across it. This beer became a favorite across the country and Lemp was the first brewery to establish coast-to-coast -coast and then international distribution of its beer. The brewery had grown to the point that it employed over 700 men, and as many as 100 horses were needed to pull the delivery wagons in St. Louis alone. It was ranked as the eighth largest in the country, and construction and renovation continued on a daily basis. The entire complex was designed in an Italian Renaissance style with arched windows, brick cornices, and eventually grew to cover five city blocks. In addition to William Lemp's financial success, he was also popular among the citizens of St. Louis. He was on the boards of several organizations, including a planning committee for the 1904 World's Fair. His family life was happy and his children were either involved in the business or successful in their own right. During the time of the Lemp Brewery's greatest success, William Lemp purchased a home for his family a short distance away from the brewery complex. The house was built by Jacob Feigert, Julia Lemp's father, in 1868. In 1876, 
Lemp purchased it for use as a residence and as an auxiliary brewery office. Although already an impressive structure, Lemp immediately began renovating and expanding it, turning it into a showplace of the period. The mansion boasted 33 rooms, elegant artwork, handcrafted wood decor, ornately painted ceilings, large, beautiful bathrooms, and even an elevator that replaced the main staircase in 1904. The house was also fitted with three room-sized walk-in vaults where paintings, jewelry, and other valuables were stored. It was a unique and wondrous place, one fitting for the first family of St. Louis Brewing. And the mansion was as impressive underground as it was above. A tunnel exited the basement of the house and entered into a portion of the cave that Adam Lemp had discovered for his beer lagering years before. Traveling along a quarried shaft, the Lemps could journey beneath the street all the way to the brewery. The advent of mechanical refrigeration also made it possible to use parts of the cave for things other than business, as will be evident later in this account. Ironically, in the midst of all this happiness and success, the Lemps family's troubles truly began. The first death in the family was that of Frederick Lemp, William Sr.'s favorite son and the heir apparent to the Lemp Empire. He had been groomed for years to take over the family business and was known as the most ambitious and hardworking of the Lemp children. In 1898, Frederick married Irene Verdon, and the couple was reportedly very happy. Frederick was prominent in social circles and was regarded as a friendly and popular fellow. In spite of this, he spent countless hours at the brewery, working hard to improve the company's future. It's possible that he may have literally worked himself to death. In 1901, Frederick's health began to fail, and so he decided to take some time off in October of that year and temporarily moved to Pasadena, California. He hoped that a change of climate might be beneficial to him. The young man's health began to greatly improve, and following a post-Thanksgiving visit, William returned to St. Louis, with hopes that his son would be returned to him soon. Unfortunately, that never happened. On December 12, Frederick suffered a sudden relapse, and he died at the age of only 28. His death was brought about by heart failure due to complications from other diseases. Frederick's death was devastating to his parents, especially to his father. Brewery secretary Henry Valkamp later wrote that when news came of the young man's death, William Lemp broke down utterly and cried like a child. He took it so seriously that we feared it would completely shatter his health and looked for the worst to happen. Lemp's friends and co-workers said that he was never the same again after Frederick's death, it was obvious to all of them that he was not coping well, and he began to slowly withdraw from the world. He was rarely seen in public, and chose to walk to the brewery each day by using the cave system beneath the house. Before his son's death, Lemp had taken pleasure in personally paying the men each week. He would join the workers in any department and work alongside them in their daily activities, or go among them and discuss any problems or questions they had. After Frederick died, these practices ceased almost completely. On January 1, 1904, William Lemp suffered another crushing blow with the death of his closest friend, Frederick Pabst. This tragedy changed Lemp even more, and soon he became indifferent to the details of running the brewery. Although he still came to the office each day, he paid little attention to the work, and those who knew him said he now seemed nervous and unsettled, and his physical and mental health were both beginning to decline. On February 13, 1904, his suffering became unbearable. When Lemp awoke that morning, he ate breakfast and mentioned to one of the servants that he was not feeling well. He finished eating, excused himself, and went back upstairs to his bedroom. Around 9.30 a.m., he shot himself in the head with a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. There was no one else in the house at the time of the shooting 
except for the servants. A servant girl, upon hearing the sound of the gunshot, ran to the door, but she found it locked. She immediately ran to the brewery office, about a half block away, and summoned sons, William Jr. and Edwin. They hurried back to the house and broke down the bedroom door. Inside, they found their father lying on the bed in a pool of blood. The revolver was still gripped in his right hand, and there was a gaping and bloody wound at his right temple. At that point, Lemp was still breathing, but unconscious. One of the boys telephoned the family physician, Dr. Henry J. Harnish, and he came at once. He and three other doctors examined William, but there was nothing they could do. William died just as his wife returned home from a shopping trip downtown. No suicide note was ever found. Immediately after the shooting, the house was closed to everyone but relatives and brewery employees were posted to intercept callers and newspaper men at the front gate. Funeral arrangements were immediately made and services took place the next day in the mansion's south parlor. The brewery was closed for the day and employees came to pay their respects before the private service was held. After the service, a cordage of 40 carriages traveled to Bellefontaine Cemetery. Although Lemp's wife, Julia, and daughters Elsa and Hilda were too grief-stricken to go to the burial ground. Eight men who had worked for Lemp for more than 30 years served as pallbearers and honorary pallbearers included many notable St. Louis residents, including Adolphus Bush, the owner of the Anheuser-Busch Brewery, who had liked and respected his principal competitor. William was placed inside the family mausoleum next to his beloved son, Frederick. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Lemp's tragic death came at a terrible time as far as the company was concerned. In the wake of his burial, all of St. Louis was preparing for the opening of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, perhaps the greatest event to ever come to the city. Not only had William been elected to the fair's board of directors, but the brewery was also involved in beer sales and displays for the event. William Jr. took his father's place and became active with the Agriculture Committee and with supervising the William J. Lemp Brewing Company's display in Agriculture Hall, where brewers and distillers from around the world assembled to show off their products. In November 1904, William Lemp Jr. took over as the president of the William J. Lemp Brewing Company. He inherited the family business and, with it, a great fortune. He filled the house with servants built country houses and spent huge sums on carriages, clothing, and art. In 1899, Will had married Lillian Handlin, the daughter of a wealthy manufacturer. Lillian was nicknamed the Lavender Lady because of her fondness for dressing in that color. She was soon spending the Lemp fortune as quickly as her husband was. While Will enjoyed showing off his trophy wife, 
he eventually grew tired of her and filed for divorce in 1906. Their divorce and the court proceedings around it created a scandal that titillated all of St. Louis. When it was all over, the Lavender Lady went into seclusion and retired from the public eye. But Will's troubles were just beginning that year. The Lemp Brewery was facing a much-altered St. Louis beer market in 1906 when nine of the large area breweries combined to form the Independent Breweries Company. The formation of the company left only Lemp, Anheuser-Busch, the Lewis Obert Brewing Company, and a handful of small neighborhood breweries as the only independent beer makers in St. Louis. Of even more concern was the expanding temperance movement in America. The growing clamor of those speaking out against alcohol was beginning to be heard in all corners of the country. It looked as though the heyday of brewing was coming to an end. The year 1906 also marked the death of Will's mother. It was discovered that she had cancer the previous year, and by March 1906, her condition had deteriorated to the point that she was in constant pain. She died in her home a short time later. Her funeral was held in the mansion and she was laid to rest in the mausoleum at Bellefontaine Cemetery. In 1911, the last major improvements were made to the Lemp Brewery when giant grain elevators were erected on the south side of the complex. That same year, the Lemp Mansion ceased being a private residence and it was converted and remodeled into the new offices of the brewing company. Like most of its competitors, the Lemp Brewery limped along through the next few years and through World War I. According to numerous accounts, though, Lemp was in far worse shape than many of the other companies. Will had allowed the company's equipment to deteriorate, and by not keeping abreast of industry innovations, much of the brewing facilities had become outmoded. And, to make matters worse, prohibition was coming. American brewers were stunned by the passing of an amendment that made the production, sales, and consumption of alcohol illegal, and by the Volstead Act, which made prohibition enforceable by law. This seemed to signal the real death of the Lemp Brewery. As the individual family members were quite wealthy, aside from the profits from the company, there was little incentive to keep it afloat. Will gave up on the idea that Congress would suddenly repeal prohibition, and he closed the Lemp plant without notice. His employees learned of the closing when they came to work one day and found the doors shut and the gates locked. Will decided to simply liquidate the assets of the plant and auction off the buildings. He sold the famous Lemp Falstaff logo to brewer Joseph Greisteek for the sum of $25,000. Greisteek purchased the recognizable Falstaff name and shield with the idea that eventually the government would see prohibition for the folly that it was and beer would be back. Lemp no longer shared the other man's enthusiasm, however, and in 1922 he sold the brewery buildings to the International Shoe Company for just $588,000, a small fraction of its estimated worth of $7 million in the years before prohibition. Sadly, virtually all of the Lemp Company records were thrown out when the shoe company moved into the complex. With Prohibition finally destroying the brewery, the 1920s looked to be a dismal decade for the Lemp family. As bad as at first seemed, things almost immediately became worse with the suicide of Elsa Lemp Wright in 1920. She became the second member of the family to take her own life. Elsa was born in 1883 and was the youngest child in the Lemp family. With the death of her mother in 1906, she became the wealthiest unmarried woman in the city after inheriting her portion of her father's estate. In 1910, she became even richer when she married Thomas Wright, the president of the Moore Jones Brass and Metal Company. They moved into a home in Horton's Place in St. Louis's Central West End. During the years between 1910 and 1918, their marriage was reportedly an unhappy and stormy one. They separated in December 1918, and in February 1919, Elsa filed for divorce. Unlike the sensational divorce of her brother, Elsa's legal battle was kept quiet and the details of the divorce were not revealed. 
It was granted in less than an hour, and the reasons were cited as general indignities. By March 8, 1920, though, Elsa and Thomas had reconciled, and the two were remarried in New York City. They returned home to St. Louis and found their house filled with flowers and cards from friends and well-wishers. The night of March 19 was a restless one for Elsa. She suffered from frequent bouts of indigestion and nausea, and her ailments caused periods of severe depression. She was awake for most of the night and slept very little. When her husband awoke the next morning, Elsa told him that she was feeling better, but she wanted to remain in bed. Wright agreed that this was the best thing for her, and he went into the bathroom and turned on the water in the tub. He then returned to the bedroom for a change of underwear, retrieved it from the closet, and went back into the bathroom. Moments after he closed the door, he heard a sharp cracking sound over the noise of the running water. Thinking that it was Elsa trying to get his attention, Wright opened the door and called to his wife. When she didn't answer, he walked into the bedroom and found her on the bed. Her eyes were open, and she seemed to be looking at him. When Wright got closer, he saw a revolver on the bed next to her. Elsa tried to speak, but couldn't, and a few moments later she took a last, shuddering breath and died. No note or letter was ever found, and Wright could give no reason as to why she would have killed herself. He was not even aware that she owned a gun. The only other persons present that morning were members of the household staff. None of them heard the shot, and none of them saw any sign that Elsa intended to end her life. They quickly summoned Dr. M. B. Clompton and Samuel Fordyce, a family friend. Strangely, the police were not notified of Elsa's death for more than two hours, and even then the news came indirectly through Samuel Fordyce. Wright became highly agitated under the scrutiny of the police investigation that followed. His only excuse for not contacting the authorities was that he was bewildered and did not know what to do. And while the mysterious circumstances around Elsa's death have had some guessing that there was more to the story than was told, her brothers seemed to find a little out of the ordinary about her demise. Will and Edwin rushed to the house as soon as they heard about the shooting. When Will arrived and was told what had happened, he only had one comment to make. That's the Lemp family for you, he said. Will himself would soon face depression and death. At first, he seemed bothered and erratic by the end of the Lemp's brewing dynasty and the sale of the factory to the International Shoe Company. He shunned public life and kept to himself, complaining often of ill health and headaches. But on December 29, 1922, he surprised everyone. On that morning, Lemp Secretary Henry Volkamp arrived at the Lemp Brewery offices around 9 a.m. When he came in the front door, he found Will already in his office. The two of them were joined shortly after by Olivia Burchek, a stenographer for the brewery and Lemp's personal secretary. Volkamp later recalled that Lemp's face was flushed that morning and that when he entered his employer's office he had an elbow on the desk and he was resting his forehead on his hand. He asked Lemp how he was feeling, and Will replied that he felt quite bad. I think you're looking better today than you did yesterday, Volkamp noted in an effort to cheer up the other man. You may think so, Will replied, but I'm feeling worse. Volkamp then left and went to his own office on the second floor of the converted mansion. Moments after this exchange, Miss Burchak telephoned Will's second wife, Ellie, about instructions for the day's mail as she was speaking to her. Lemp picked up the other line and spoke to his wife himself. The secretary recalled that he spoke very quietly, and she did not hear what turned out to be his last words to his wife. After Lemp finished the conversation, Burchek asked him a question about some copying that she was doing from a blueprint. He first told her that what she had was fine, and then he changed his mind and suggested that she go down to the basement and speak to the brewery's architect, Mr. Norton. While she was on her way downstairs, she heard a loud noise. Because there were men working in the basement, she thought nothing of it, assuming that someone had dropped something. 
but when she came back upstairs, she found Will lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Another employee had also been working upstairs, and when he heard the same loud noise that Miss Burchak later reported, he recognized it as a gunshot. He ran downstairs to find Will lying on the floor with his feet under the desk. He called for help, and men from the office across the hall came and put a pillow under Will's head. Apparently, just after speaking to Miss Burchak, Lamp had shot himself in the heart with a 38 caliber revolver. He had unbuttoned his vest and fired the gun through his shirt. When discovered, Lamp was still breathing, but he died by the time a doctor could arrive. Captain William Doyle, the lead police investigator on the scene, searched Lemp's pockets and desk for a suicide note. But, as with his father and his sister before him, Will left no indication as to why he had ended his life. Oddly, Lemp seemed to have no intention of killing himself despite being depressed. After the sale of the brewery, he had discussed selling off the rest of the assets, like land parcels and saloon locations, and planned to then just take it easy. Not long after that announcement, he had even put his estate in Webster Groves up for sale, stating that he planned to travel in Europe for a while. A week before his death, he had dined with his friend August A. Bush, who said that Lamp seemed cheerful at the time, and gave no indication that he was worrying about business or anything else. He was a fine fellow, Bush added, and it's hard to believe that he has taken his own life. The funeral of William Lamp Jr. was held on December 31st at the Lamp Mansion. The offices were used as the setting for the services for sentimental reasons, staff members said. He was interred in the family mausoleum at Belfontaine Cemetery in the crypt, just above that of his sister Elsa. With William Jr. gone and his brothers involved with their own endeavors, it seemed that the days of the Lemp Empire had come to an end at last. The two brothers, still in St. Louis, had left the family enterprise long before it had closed down. Charles worked in banking and finance, and Edwin had entered a life in seclusion at his estate in Kirkwood in 1911. The fortune they had amassed was more than enough to keep the surviving members of the family comfortable through the Great Depression and beyond. But the days of Lemp tragedy were not yet over. In 1933, Prohibition was officially repealed and almost immediately, beer was once again being brewed in St. Louis. The future was bright once more for many of the local companies, but dark days were still ahead for the remaining members of the Lemp family. By the late 1920s, only Charles and Edwin Lemp were left in the immediate family. Throughout his life, Charles was never much involved with the Lamp Brewery. His interests had been elsewhere, and when the family home was renovated into offices, he made his residence at the Racquet Club in St. Louis. His work had mostly been in the banking and financial industries, and he sometimes dabbled in politics as well. In 1929, Charles moved back to the Lemp Mansion, and the house became a private residence once more. Despite his very visible business and political life, Charles remained a mysterious figure who became even odder and more reclusive with age. He remained a lifelong bachelor and lived alone in his old, rambling house with only his two servants, Albert and Lena Bittner, for company. By the age of 77, he was arthritic and quite ill. Legend has it that he was deathly afraid of germs and wore gloves to avoid contact with bacteria. He had grown quite bitter and eccentric and had developed a morbid attachment to the Lemp family home. Due to the history of the place, his brother Edwin often encouraged him to move out, but Charles refused. Finally, when he could stand no more of life, he became the fourth member of the Lemp family to commit suicide. On May 10, 1949, Alfred Bittner went to the kitchen and prepared breakfast for Charles as he normally did. He then placed the breakfast tray on the desk in the office next to the Lemp's bedroom, as he'd been doing for years. Bittner later recalled that the door to the bedroom was closed and he did not look inside. At about 8 a.m., Bittner returned to the office to remove the tray and found it to be untouched. Concerned, 
he opened the bedroom door to see if Charles was awake and discovered that he was dead from a bullet wound to the head. When the police arrived, they found Lemp still in bed and lightly holding a 38 caliber Army Colt revolver in his right hand. He was the only one of the family who had left a suicide note behind. He had dated the letter May 9 and had written, in case I'm found dead, blame it on no one but me, and had signed it at the bottom. Oddly, Charles had made detailed funeral arrangements for himself long before his death. He would be the only member of the family not interred at the mausoleum at Bellefontaine Cemetery, and while this might be unusual, it was nearly as strange as the rest of the instructions that he left behind. In a letter that was received at a South St. Louis funeral home in 1941, Lemp ordered that, upon his death, his body should be immediately taken to the Missouri crematory. His ashes were then to be placed in a wicker box and buried on his farm. He also ordered that his body not be bathed, changed, or clothed, and that no services were to be held for him and no death notice published, no matter what any surviving members of his family might want. On May 11, 1949, Edwin Lemp picked up his brother's remains at the funeral home and took them to the farm to be buried. And while these instructions were certainly odd, they were not the most enduring mystery about this arrangement. After all of these years, there is no record of where Charles Lemp's farm was located. The Lemp family, which had once been so large and prosperous, had now been almost utterly destroyed in a span of less than a century. Only Edward Lemp remained, and he had long avoided the life that had turned so tragic for the rest of his family. He was known as a quiet, reclusive man who had walked away from the Lemp Brewery in 1913 to live a peaceful life on his secluded estate in Kirkwood. Here, he communed with nature and became an excellent gourmet cook and animal lover. He collected fine art and entertained his intimate friends. Edwin managed to escape from the family curse, but as he grew older, he became more eccentric and developed a terrible fear of being alone. He never spoke about his family or their tragic lives, but it must have preyed on him all the same. His fears caused him to simply entertain more and to keep a companion with him at his estate almost all the time. His most loyal friend and companion was John Bopp, the caretaker of the estate for the last 30 years of Edwin's life. His loyalty to his employer was absolute, and it is believed that Bopp was never away from the estate for more than a few days at a time. He never discussed any of Lemp's personal thoughts or habits and remained faithful to Edwin, even after his friend's death. Edwin passed away quietly, of natural causes, at age 90 in 1970. The last order that John Bob carried out for him must have been the worst. According to Edwin's wishes, he burned all of the paintings that Lemp had collected throughout his life, as well as priceless Lemp family papers and artifacts. These irreplaceable pieces of history vanished in the smoke of a blazing bonfire and, like the Lemp Empire, were lost forever. The Lemp family line died out with Edwin, and while none of them remain today, it's almost certain that some of them are still around. After the death of Charles Lemp, the Grand Family Mansion was sold and turned into a boarding house. Shortly after that, it fell on hard times and began to deteriorate, along with the nearby neighborhood. In later years, stories began to emerge that residents of the boarding house often complained of ghostly knocks and phantom footsteps in the house. As these tales spread, it became increasingly hard to find tenants to occupy the rooms, and because of this, the old limp mansion was rarely filled. One strange account from the days following Charles' death was told by a young woman who decided to sneak into the house with some friends one day in 1949. The house was vacant at the time, and the group managed to get into the front door, and they started up the main staircase to the second floor. They climbed the steps to the first landing, and then prepared to go up the last set of stairs to the upper level. Just as they reached the landing, they looked up and saw a filmy apparition coming down the steps toward them. The young girl later described it as an almost human-shaped puff of smoke. The group took one look at it and ran. 
When she told this story for the first time in the late 1990s, the woman, who was quite elderly by this time, stated that she had never been back to the mansion since. The decline of the house continued until 1975, when Dick Pointer and his family purchased it. The Pointers began remodeling and renovating the place, working for many years to turn it into a restaurant and an inn. But the Pointers were soon to find out that they were not alone in the house. The bulk of the remodeling was done in the 1970s, and during this time, workers reported that ghostly events were occurring in the house. Almost all of the workers confessed that they believed the place was haunted and told a feeling as though they were being watched. They spoke of strange sounds and complained of tools that vanished and then returned in different places from where they had left. At one point in the renovations, a painter was brought in to work on the ceilings. He stayed overnight in the house while he completed the job. One day, he was in his room and ran downstairs to tell one of the pointers that he'd heard the sound of horses' hooves on the cobblestones outside his window. Dick Pointer convinced the painter that he was mistaken. There were no horses and no cobblestones outside the house. In time, the man finished the ceilings and left, but the story stayed on Pointer's mind. Later that year, he noticed that some of the grass in the yard had turned brown. He dug underneath it and found that beneath the top level of soil was a layer of cobblestones. During the Lemp's residency in the house, that portion of the yard had been a drive to the carriage house. Later in the restoration, another artist was brought in to restore the painted ceiling in one of the front dining rooms. It had been covered over with paper years before. While he was lying on his back on the scaffolding, he felt a sensation of what he believed was a spirit moving past him. It frightened him so badly that he left the house without his brushes and tools and refused to return and get them. A few months after this event, an elderly man came into the restaurant and told one of the staff members that he had once been a driver for the Lemp family. He explained that the ceiling in the dining room had been papered over because William Lemp hated the design that had been painted on it. The staff members, upon hearing the story, noted that the artist had gotten the distinct impression that the spirit he encountered had been angry. Was it perhaps because he was restoring the unwanted ceiling? During the restorations, Dick Pointer lived alone in the house and became quite an expert on the ghostly manifestations. One night he was lying in bed, reading, when he heard a door slam loudly in another part of the house. No one else was supposed to be in the house and he was sure that he had locked all the doors. Fearing that someone might have broken in, he got his dog, a large Doberman named Shadow, and decided to take a look around. The dog was spooked by this time and having also heard the sound, she had her ears turned up, listening for anything else. They searched the entire house and found no one there. Every door had been locked, just as Pointer had left them. He reported that the same thing happened again about a month later. But again, nothing was found. After the restaurant opened, staff members began to report their own odd experiences. Glasses were seen to lift off the bar and fly through the air. Sounds were often heard that had no explanation, and some even glimpsed actual apparitions that appeared and vanished at will. In addition, many customers and visitors to the house reported some pretty weird incidents. It was said that doors locked and unlocked on their own. The piano in the bar played by itself. Voices and sounds came from nowhere, and even the spirit of the lavender lady, Lillian Handlin, was spotted on occasion. Late one evening, Dick was bartending after most of the customers had departed and the water in a pitcher began swirling around of its own volition. Pointer was sure that he was just seeing things, but all the customers who remained that night swore they saw the same thing. Then, one night in August 1981, Dick and an employee were startled to hear the piano start playing a few notes by itself. There was no one around it at the time, and in fact no one else in the entire building. 
The piano had continued to be the source of eerie occurrences as the years have passed. No matter where the piano has been placed in the house, whether in the main hallway upstairs or in the guest rooms, its keys have reportedly tinkled without the touch of human hands. And while the ghostly atmosphere of the place has admittedly attracted a number of patrons, it has also caused the owners to lose a number of valuable employees. One of them was a former waitress named Bonnie Strayhorn, who encountered an unusual customer while working one day. The restaurant had not yet opened for business when she saw a dark-haired man seated at one of the tables in the rear dining room. She was surprised that someone had come so early, but she went over to ask if he would like a cup of coffee. He simply sat there and did not answer. Bonnie frowned and looked away for a moment. When she looked back just moments later, the man was gone. She has continued to maintain that the man could not have left the room in the brief seconds when she was not looking at him. After that incident, she left the Lamp Mansion and went to work in a non-haunted location. In addition to customers, the house has also attracted ghost hunters from around the country. Many of them are attracted by the publicity that has been achieved by the house as a haunted location. The mansion has appeared in scores of magazines, newspaper articles, books, and television shows over the years, but it first gained notoriety back in the 1970s when it was investigated by the Haunt Hunters. These two St. Louis men, Phil Goodwilling and Gordon Honer, actively researched ghost stories and sightings in the area, and during that period, they conducted a class on ghosts at St. Louis University. They promised their students that they would take them to a real haunted place and decided that the Lemp Mansion fit the bill. In October 1979, they brought the class to the house and invited along a local television crew to film the event. Goodwilling and Honer divided the students up into small groups and gave them all writing planchettes to try and contact the spirits. The devices, like the small rolling platforms that come with Ouija boards, were used to spell out messages from the ghosts. The students were divided into groups of four. One of the group asked, is there an unseen presence that wishes to communicate? Yes, came the answer, scrawled on a large piece of paper as the planchette with its pencil tip moved across the surface. The students asked another question, will you identify yourself? The planchette scratched out a reply, Charles Lemp. Goodwilling later noted that the students who received this message were the most skeptical in the class. He also noted that no one in the room that night, with the exception of Dick Pointer, had any idea that Charles had committed suicide. At that time, the history of the house had not been widely publicized. After the name was revealed, the spirit added that he had taken his own life. When asked why he did this, the spirit replied in three words, help, death, rest. It might also be added that by the time this seance was over, the four students were no longer the most skeptical in the class. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. In 
in November, the Haunt Hunters returned to the house, bringing along a camera crew from the popular show of the era, Real People. Goodwilling and Honer participated in a seance with two other persons, neither of whom had any knowledge about the past history of the mansion. They once again made contact with a spirit who identified himself as Charles Lemp, and he was asked again why he had committed suicide. The spirit reportedly used a derogatory term and then added, damn Roosevelt. Apparently, the Lemps had not been fond of the politics practiced by Franklin D. Roosevelt during their time. The seance continued with the next question from the group, is there a message for someone in this house? The answer came, yes, yes, Edwin, money. The group then asked if there was anything they could do to free the spirit from being trapped in the house. Yes, yes, the ghost replied. Unfortunately, they were unsuccessful in finding out what they could do to help. Goodwilling felt that if the spirit was actually Charles Lemp, then he might have stayed behind in the house because of his suicide. He might have had a message for his brother, Edwin Lemp, whom he tried to contact during the seance. He may have believed that Edwin was still alive and, based on the conversation, was trying to pass along a message about money. Could this be what caused Charles Lemp's ghost to remain behind? Most important, perhaps, to the reader is the question of whether the Lemp Mansion still remains haunted today. Many will tell you that it does, although the current owners accept this as just part of the house's unusual ambience. One of the current owners, Paul Pointer, helps to maintain the place as a popular eating and lodging establishment. He accepts the ghosts as just another part of this unique mansion. People come here expecting to experience weird things, he said, and fortunately for us, they are rarely disappointed. I first heard about the Lemp Mansion and its hauntings back in the early 1990s, when the first, wildly skewed stories about the ghosts began to appear in what few ghosts books were available in those days. At my first opportunity, I traveled to St. Louis to see the house, and a couple of years later I spent the night there for the first time. Even then, it was an amazing house, although the bed and breakfast service was in its early stages. I stayed there on a scorching June night with a few friends, and aside from a couple of struggling window units, there was no cooling system in the place. The house was stifling until about 2 a.m. when it finally started to cool down. On the bright side, we had the entire house to ourselves, and Paul Pointer gave us permission to roam anywhere we wanted to. We took him up on it and scoured the mansion from top to bottom in search of not only ghosts, but an entrance to the legendary caverns that were supposed to exist under the house. The book that I had read, which featured the Lemp Mansion, had been badly out of date and stated that the caves were accessible from the mansion. Later, when I started researching the house from my own writings about the Lemp family, I would find out that the cave entrance had been closed for many years. I never gave up on the idea of getting into the cave, however, and eventually my persistence paid off. My first day in the Lemp Mansion was largely uneventful, although there was one incident that occurred that I have never been able to explain. At some point, around 3 a.m., we heard someone on the main staircase that leads from the front foyer to the second floor. We were sitting in the hallway at the top of the stairs talking quietly when we heard what sounded like heavy footsteps. One of my friends got up and walked over to see if someone, perhaps one of the staff members, had returned to the mansion. She called the rest of us over when she noticed that, although we could all still hear someone walking, there was no one on the staircase. All of us witnessed this eerie phenomenon, which continued for several minutes and went up and down the stairs several times. While it was occurring, I went down the stairs to see if I could sense anyone going past me or if there was a temperature change or some sort of movement. I never felt a thing, but there was no denying that we could hear someone walking. The footsteps continued for a few minutes and then stopped. We looked under the steps, up and down them, and even tried measuring and jumping on them. We were unable to duplicate the sounds that we heard. 
It sounded exactly like someone wearing heavy boots walking back and forth, and if there were anything else, I can't begin to imagine what it was. I visited the mansion a number of other times as the years went by, but it would be until 2003 when I would spend another night there. This time, however, I did not spend the night inside the house but under it, in the famous caverns that had originally been used by the Lemps to lager their beer. A reporter for the Missouri Republican newspaper once wrote that Lemps Cave had three separate chambers and that each of them contained large casks that were capable of holding 20 to 30 barrels of beer. The lagering cellars were opened for use in 1845, but Lemp soon expanded them to store more than 3,000 barrels of beer at one time. The beer cellars had been created by simply clearing out the natural underground river channels that had been carved from the limestone. They were divided off by the construction of masonry and brick walls into artificial rooms. During the early period of the brewery's history, Lemp was still brewing the beer near the downtown riverfront and taking it by wagon to the cave for the lagering period. After the death of Adam Lemp, his son William would construct a new brewery above the cave. Around 1850, just about the time that the Lemp Brewery was just beginning to grow, fur trader Henry Chatelain built a home on a piece of property that adjoined Lemp's property at the crest of Arsenal Hill on 13th Street. In 1856, Dr. Nicholas de Menel purchased the house and land, and he began enlarging and expanding the farmhouse a few years later. He added several rooms to the house and a magnificent portico that faced eastward and looked out over his large garden and the Mississippi River. The Greek Revival Mansion became a favorite landmark for river pilots rounding a landmark known as Chatelon's Bend. In 1865, De Menel leased the southwest corner of the property to the Minnehaha Brewery, and they built a small two-story frame brewery on the site. For several years, De Menel had been using a cave that was located beneath his house as a place to store perishable goods, and he also leased a portion of this cave to Charles Fritchell and Louis Zepp, the owners of the brewery. Like Adam Lemp, they planned to use the caverns as a place to lager beer, and over the course of the next year, they made a number of improvements to the cave. Unfortunately, the brewery went out of business in 1867 and de Menel acquired the buildings. During the years of these operations, both the Lemps and the Minnehaha Brewery were using different parts of the same cave. A wall had been constructed between the two businesses, but the Lemps had little to fear from this short-lived competition. It's also believed that they must have been on good terms with Dr. Menel, when the Lemp family renovated their home just down the street from the De Menel mansion, an arrangement was made to run three pipelines through De Menel's cave, furnishing the Lemp mansion with hot and cold water and beer from the brewery complex down the street. The Lemps continued to use the cave until artificial refrigeration was installed at the factory. After that, the cave no longer played its role in beer production, so it was turned into a private playground for the Lemp family. A tunnel exited the basement of the house and entered into the portion of the cave that Adam Lemp had discovered for his beer lagering years before. Traveling along a quarried shaft, the Lemps could journey beneath the street, all the way to the brewery. One large chamber was converted into a natural auditorium and theater with scenery constructed of plaster and wire. Crude floodlights were used to illuminate the scene and the Lemps were believed to have hired actors on the theater and vaudeville circuits of the day to come into the cave for private performances. This section of the cave was accessible by way of a spiral staircase that once ascended to Cherokee Street. This entrance is sealed today, and the spiral stairs were cut away to prevent anyone from entering the cave. East of the theater was another innovation of the Lemp family. Just below the intersection of Cherokee and Demental Streets, was a large concrete-lined pool that had been a reservoir back in the days of underground lagering. In the years that followed, the Lemps converted it into a wading pool by using hot water that was piped in from the brewery's boiler house, located a short distance away. After Prohibition, the caves were abandoned and the entrances sealed shut. However, this was not the end for the Minnehaha portion of the cave. 
In November 1946, a pharmaceutical manufacturer named Lee Hess bought not only the Minnehaha portion of the cave, but the old Demenel mansion and grounds as well. He set to work developing the cave as a tourist attraction. He erected a museum building and parking lot to serve what he dubbed Cherokee Cave. The cave became a popular tourist attraction, but some still tell stories about Hess and his strange obsession with the cavern. He nearly lost his entire fortune trying to develop it, and only two rooms of the sprawling Demental House were used during his time there. He and his wife shared one room, and Albert Hoffman, who managed the cave, lived in the other. In April 1950, Cherokee Cave was opened to the public, and it was a popular attraction for more than 10 years. Visitors to the cave were able to stroll along on a tour that took them to Cherokee Lake and the Petrified Falls and, of course, to the famed Spaghetti Room, where slender cave formations hung down from the ceiling like strands of pasta. The cave remained open until 1960. In 1961, it was purchased by the Missouri Highway Department to clear the way for Interstate 55. Hess battled to the end of his life to keep the state from destroying the Demensal Mansion, and he eventually succeeded. Although the cave museum and entrance could not be saved. The building and the entrance that Hess had created were demolished in 1964. Today, the only reminder of this unique place is a short street near Broadway and Cherokee Street in St. Louis called Cave Street. The Demental Mansion became a historic site and museum. For years after the interstate tore through this historic portion of the city, it was believed that Cherokee Cave had been filled in and completely destroyed. It was later discovered that this was wrong and that portions of the cave still exist today. While not accessible to the public, the mystery of the place still remains alive. Cave researchers and spelunkers have toured these passages in recent years, but the last documented visits took place in the middle 1960s. During the visit, accounts told of the labyrinth of rooms that were constructed by the lamps that revealed the remains of broken and rotted wood casks where beer was once aged in cellars. Visitors passed through oversized doorways and into rooms lined with brick and stone. The wading pool remained as well, now filthy and covered with mud. The theater still existed, although it was hard to imagine audiences who might have assembled here to watch a performance. When the theater was built, the lamps tore out the natural formations of the cave and replaced them with artificial cave formations made from plaster and wood. Tinted in odd colors, they formed the backdrop for the stage. And while many can attest to the haunting that occurs in the Lemp Mansion, once accessible from the cave, there are others who insist that the cave is haunted too. Stories have been told about strange sounds and shapes that have been seen and heard down there and cannot be explained away as the weird but natural environment of a cave. In recent times, the brewery above the cave has occasionally been the site of a haunted house attraction that has been staged by the current owners of the Lemp Mansion restaurant. While a standard attraction of that type, in some cases, the customers sometimes got a little more than they bargained for. On at least one occasion, the attraction was reportedly closed down after a staff member spotted someone in an off-limits area that led down to the cave entrances. The customers were stopped at the door while employees tried to track down this wandering visitor and escort him out. However, after a thorough search, there was no one found. The trespasser had completely vanished. On other occasions, apparitions had been seen and one staff member, who entered the cave itself, claimed to hear the sound of someone with hard-soled shoes walking behind him in some of the abandoned passageways. Unnerved, he began walking faster, only to have the mysterious footsteps keep pace with him. Suddenly, perhaps thinking it was only his imagination or an echo of the cave playing tricks on him, he stopped abruptly, fully expecting the tapping of the shoes to stop as well. But they continued on for several more steps before stopping. Now feeling quite frightened, he turned and illuminated the passage behind him with his flashlight, and there was no one there. Needless to say, he immediately left the cave. And the stories have continued to be told over the past few years. 
Lemp Mansion owner Paul Pointer told me a few years ago that he hoped to possibly reopen the caves someday and perhaps start a cave museum in the old brewery buildings that would highlight the natural history that still exists under the city. Forays into the caves for research purposes have added to the haunted lore of the place, but unfortunately it was unlikely that I would ever get to experience this for myself. After discovering that the cave was no longer accessible from the house, I gave up on the idea of ever seeing it. The Lemp Caverns and legendary Cherokee Cave were now closed and forgotten, perhaps for all time. I finally resigned myself to the fact that it was a place that I would never get to see. At least, that's what I thought at the time. In March 2003, I received an invitation from some acquaintances as well as my friend Luke Nalaborski and Paul Pointer to come along on an excursion into the one place in St. Louis that I never imagined I would get to see, the Lemp Caverns and Cherokee Cave. Paul had offered a private tour of the caverns and I immediately said that I would come. On a chilly night in early March, we assembled at the nearby Lemp Mansion and then followed Paul as he led us to one of the rear entrances to the brewery buildings, now the only access into the caves. We entered one of the buildings and first had the rare treat of touring the brewery building itself, even riding one of the original elevators to the top floor and going out on the roof for an incredible view of South St. Louis. The warehouse buildings of the brewery are utterly massive, with huge open floors that once held the brewing and packaging machinery and storage casks for the beer. In later times, after artificial refrigeration, the beer had been stored in various locations in the building. As we descended to the lower areas of the brewery, we would literally go back in time to the earliest days of the company, when beer had to be stored in low, cool areas to lager. Staircases and elevators took us lower into the brewery until we finally entered the areas that were underground. Here we found massive rooms with curved archways, detailed stone and brickwork and ponderous ceilings that had been built with individual arched sections to add extra support for the gigantic stone buildings overhead. When the brewery was open, the foundations would have had to support incredible weight in machinery, men, and the huge casks of beer. In each section that we explored as we went deeper underground, we found remnants of the brewery and the heyday of the Lemp Empire. In the upper sections, we found only occasional worn-away emblems in the shape of the famous Lemp Shield, which later became the Falstaff logo, original light fixtures, hidden designs in doors and glass fixtures, but little else. As we descended deeper underground, however, the remains of the brewery became more noticeable, and in some locations they appeared almost untouched, as though the last people to walk there before we did had been the men who received a paycheck from the Lemp Brewery each week. Leaving the gigantic arched rooms behind, we went down a long, curved staircase to what would be considered the sub-basement of the brewery. This was at the same level as the first portion of the cave. It was through this level that the lamps would ascend to the brewery as they walked to work on many mornings, using the cave to travel from the mansion to their offices. It was here that William Lemp had walked as he began his descent into his depression and madness that would later claim his life. Our flashlights illuminated this area of the complex, which seemed well on its way to being reclaimed by the cave from which it had been carved. The floors were covered with mud, moss and algae in some places, and water dripped constantly from the walls and the ceilings. The brick was slowly crumbling beneath decades of dampness. It was this area of the brewery, the actual cave, where Adam Lemp had stored the first lager beer in St. Louis. There are several chambers that had been created here with high, curved ceilings, and it was inside these chambers where the original casks were placed. Ice was cut from the river during the winter months and then placed in the chambers to keep the beer cool. As it melted, the water would drain off into the sides of the chambers and into the water that flowed through the cave itself. On the sides of these long rooms, the cave water was visible and, while extremely clear, 
it left behind mineral deposits on the stone floor, making it plain that it was not fit to drink. We then left the finished areas of the cave, with its stone floor and brick-lined walls, and entered a passageway that would take us into the wild areas of the cave that remained. To reach this section, we passed through a long, rugged corridor that was so damp and filled with moisture that many of the photographs we took that night were so fogged that it was impossible to make out details. This was before I started using a digital camera and several of my own photographs were lost, but by continuing to clean my lens throughout the evening, I was able to take some of the first photos of the caverns that had been captured in years. This long passageway, which led deeper into the cave, was littered with fallen stone, mud, and refuse from the old days of the brewery. Above our heads were metal brackets and chains that had once been part of a conveyor belt system for transporting ice into the logger vaults. A motor from the conveyor belt is still resting on the side of the path through the passageway. At the end of it, a metal ladder dangled from the ceiling and led upwards into a narrow, shadowy hole. During the early days of the brewery, this had been a shaft that was used to dump ice down into the cave. It was loaded onto cars on the conveyor belt and then mechanically moved to the loggering areas. This hole was sealed off many years ago and the metal ladder has fallen into disrepair. Our first area of exploration took us to the left of the passage and we traveled down a wide tunnel toward what was once the Lemp's Theater. The old theater is literally in ruins today. An archway at the back, which led to another chamber, was one of the few remaining architectural pieces, as the scenery that had been created for the theater now lay in heaping piles on the floor. It has long since been destroyed, but some of the garish colors that had been painted on the plaster and stone can still be seen. Overhead, an old electric light bar remained that once illuminated the small stage. Its bulbs have long since been shattered, and I couldn't help but wonder, as I stood looking around the room that was shrouded in a heavy mist, just how much privacy the lamps must have craved. I couldn't imagine huddling down here, far underground in this damp and dark chamber, just so I could attend private performances of popular programs. And how much did the lamps offer to get the actors to put on these command performances? The theater remains an eerie and downright spooky place. I would not be surprised to learn that the ghosts of these actors still linger here, still walking a stage that vanished long ago. The theater marked the end of the passage, so we turned back in the direction we had come from and once more ended up beneath the ice chute to the surface. Just beyond this is the famed swimming pool of the Lemp family. The pool was actually just a wading pool, and it was only used for this purpose after electric refrigeration was installed in the brewery. Before this, it was a reservoir for runoff from the melting ice. To visit the site today, you can still see the smooth walls of the reservoir, but over the years it has been heavily clogged with falls of rock and from the cave ceilings and by copious amounts of mud and clay. It bears little resemblance to any sort of wading pool now, and it was certainly not inviting enough for me to want to consider rolling up my pant legs and walking in. The pool is still filled with approximately two feet of water and is a habitat for the blind white fish that dwell in caves. The animals are fairly rare, but they can be found in the old limp caverns. Once we traveled past the reservoir, we entered the actual passages of Cherokee Cave, here, the natural contours of the cave had been opened up and the floor had been artificially smoothed and fitted with curbs on each side of the path to keep the majority of the water away. These improvements, along with the remains of the electrical wiring and light boxes, had been left behind when Lee Hess had been forced to abandon the cave back in 1961. They were just a few of the signs of the commercial cave that we would find in the passages ahead. As the trip progressed, the commercial aspects of the cave became more and more obvious. At one point, we reached a ravine that cut across the path and had to use a metal ladder to climb down and cross the stone steps on the other side. An alternate route opened to the right, and we descended another flight of steps, which were fitted with metal handrails 
that had been installed nearly 50 years before. We discovered more signs of the commercial Cherokee cave and stripped out electrical lines and carefully constructed walkways. It was this passage that had originally connected the cave and brewery to the Lemp Mansion. The entrance from the house has long since been sealed off and is no longer accessible, but I looked forward to seeing it anyway. However, as we began to get nearer to the house, the water that now covered the floor grew deeper. To make matters worse, Paul began to get very concerned about the quality of the air in the passageway. This had been a problem with some of the cave exploration that had been done in recent years. On one occasion, one member of a group of spelunkers had to be carried out of the cave after passing out. We tried checking the air with a flame from a lighter, and we watched as the flame grew weaker and weaker as we progressed along the passage. Eventually, it flickered and went out, and we had to turn back. I was the last to return, feeling a great sense of loss for the now forgotten cave. I wondered if the others had the same sense of the history that we were privileged enough to be experiencing, walking where very few had walked in nearly half a century. This was, I realized, a haunted place, but whether by ghosts or by time, I was unable to say. Our final passage awaited us and led us deeper into the cave, or if we had visited Cherokee Cave when it was in business, it would have led us out of the cave. This was the original shaft that had been opened by Lee Hess and would have ended at the visitor center and parking lot if they'd not been demolished in the early 1960s. The passage made a sharp right turn, although ahead of us was a man-made basin that had been built to catch runoff from a small spring that flowed from the cave wall. A trickle of water was still running into the basin even now. We turned into this last passageway but only traveled for a short distance before coming to what had been dubbed the Cherokee Lake by Lee Hess, a stone bridge that had been built across the lake decades ago but the path of the opposite side of it ended abruptly at a stone wall. This wall had been placed here by the Missouri Department of Transportation during the construction of Interstate 55. When they had raised the visitor center to build the highway, the cave had also been sealed off, bringing to an end an element of St. Louis's mysterious and colorful history. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, Please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, It's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together, they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love The Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Our return journey back through the labyrinth of cave passages, doorways, staircases, lagering chambers, and brewery corridors took us much less time to complete than it had when we were descending. I was surprised to discover we had actually been underground for several hours. I remember walking back down the corridors where the conveyor belt system had been, which led from the cave to the loggering caverns, and looking back into the darkness and mist behind us. 
I'm not sure what I expected to see or hear. The sound of other, more ethereal explorers following behind us, or perhaps the specters of the lamps themselves, still trudging to the brewery after all these years? I don't know for sure, but I know that I expected something. I wish that I could tell you that I had some ghostly experience while exploring these haunted caverns, but unfortunately I cannot. The ghosts were certainly there, though, at least in a figurative sense, because no one can come there and not feel the very tangible spirit of the past. It was an experience that I may never be able to repeat, and one that I will certainly never forget. My next overnight stay at the Lemp Mansion was arranged on February 13, 2004, the 100th anniversary of the suicide of William Lemp. This momentous occasion was attended by a number of investigators and we gathered at the house in preparation for what we believed would be an active night. Among those present that night were several investigators from the American Ghost Society who had stayed at the house before and nearly all of us had previously experienced unexplained activity while there. But the activity that we would experience that night had nothing to do with ghosts. After dinner that evening, the group met at the house and established a base of operations in one of the rooms on the second floor. We were anticipating a great night because I knew there had been strange happenings in the house in recent months. I heard from several people who stayed in the house during the fall months, and they all spoke of the usual phantom footsteps, disembodied voices, and items that disappeared and moved about, but there was one strange incident that I knew about that I could actually vouch for. In August 2003, I had invited my friend Leslie Rule, a fellow ghostwriter and the daughter of crime author Ann Rule, to come to Alton, Illinois and speak at an event that I was hosting there. She had wanted to stay somewhere haunted while in the area, and I helped her to make arrangements to stay at the Lemp Mansion for several nights. She was very excited at the prospect until she called to make reservations and was told by co-owner Patty Pointer that she would have the mansion all to herself during the day. Leslie was not enthused about sleeping in a haunted house alone, and she asked me if I might know of someone who would consider staying with her. I suggested that she contact my friend Anita Daituko, and the two of them planned an overnight at the mansion. Anita and her 22-year-old daughter Amy picked up Leslie at the airport and all of us met for dinner. Anita and Amy had stopped by the mansion before dinner, picked up the keys, and had turned on the lights in their rooms as a test, Amy explained. Since the lights in the empty house had a reputation for turning themselves off and on, she wanted to see what would happen. When we all went back to the house after dinner and found that some of the lights were no longer on, though, she nervously dismissed this as someone playing a joke on them. I wouldn't find out how scared Amy was about staying in the house until after I talked to her and Anita a few days later. Leslie later told me that the young woman was very tentative about exploring the house with her and that it took some urging to get her into some of the creepier parts, like the dark and ominous attic. To make matters worse, their flashlight batteries unexpectedly went out while they were in the attic, unsettling Amy even further. But perhaps Amy had a good reason to be unsettled. A number of women who have worked in the house and have stayed the night there have had encounters with a female spirit or have heard someone calling their names. Some believe this spirit may be that of Elsa Lemp, who, while she did not die in the house, spent a large amount of her life there. They were her happiest times, and perhaps she has returned here seeking peace after her death. Regardless of who this lovely spirit may be, many women have encountered her, including Amy. A few days after her nerve-wracking stay, Amy told me that she had been trying to go to sleep next to her mother in the lavender suite on the second floor and was having trouble dozing off. After tossing and turning for a while, she turned over and was terrified to see a woman in a long dress standing next to the bed. The woman looked very real, but there was no way that she could have gotten into the room through the locked door. Before Amy could do or say anything, the woman leaned toward her, 
placed a finger to her lips and made a shushing motion, as if to tell Amy to be quiet and to go to sleep. The woman then simply vanished. Needless to say, Amy did not sleep for the rest of the night. I recalled this incident while unpacking my things for our anniversary overnight at the mansion. Since the house had been so active in the preceding months, it seemed likely that we were going to be in for an exciting night. What better time to be at the house than on the night when the first Lemp suicide occurred? We spent the first few hours of the night exploring the house while I recounted the history of the brewery and told of the series of tragic events that had befallen the family. After a time, we split up into groups and began investigating and photographing the house. I wandered between the floors, checking in with the various groups and had just gone into the basement when I heard a loud gasp from one of the rooms at the back of the house. I went back to see what was going on and I was told by one of the investigators that they had heard someone walking around. They were startled by the footsteps, which explained the loud gasp, and went to find the source of the sounds. We were standing there talking when suddenly a dark shadow loomed up against the window. As it turned out, what we thought might be a ghost was actually just a late arrival to the house. The shadow was my friend Dave Goodwin, an author and police officer who had been working a late shift and was just then arriving for the anniversary overnight. I let Dave into the house and the night continued with more photos and experimentation with equipment. The evening took a bad turn when the night's only activity began at about 1.30 a.m. One of the investigators happened to glance out the window of one of the downstairs dining rooms and noticed that the trunk of a car in the parking lot was standing open. After alerting everyone, Dave and I went straight outside and saw someone running away. We soon learned that several of the cars parked in the lot had been broken into and bags, purses, and personal items had been stolen. One of the cars belonged to two young men who brought dozens of pieces of paranormal investigation equipment with them. They had so much stuff that they left several cases in their car. They also had a laptop computer and several other expensive items. The laptop was left untouched, but the thieves made off with their cases and ghost detection devices. One can only imagine what went through their minds when they opened the cases and saw the bizarre and largely useless to most people items inside. After calling the police and sorting out what was missing, the evening was largely a bust. With only a couple of hours left to investigate, we made the most of it by either continuing with the investigations or catching a short nap. As it ended up, some of the stolen items were later recovered and everyone breathed a sigh of relief that nothing more valuable had been taken. It made for a memorable night, but it was definitely not what we had in mind. The next overnight that I hosted to the Lemp Mansion was in May of that same year. It was a few days after the May 10 anniversary of Charles Lemp's suicide, but based on the way that the last anniversary overnight had turned out, I decided not to mention it to anyone. I was once again joined at the house by a number of investigators, as well as my friends Dave Goodwin, Darren Deist, Rex Murray, and Amanda Schmidt. We all enjoyed the tour and working with the various groups as they began their investigations. At one point, a strange event occurred that I was lucky enough to actually witness for myself. One of the standard things that we do at the Lemp Mansion is bring along a Ouija board and give people a chance to work within the house. Without going into the pros and cons of using a Ouija board, the reader may have noticed from earlier in the chapter that such devices have been involved with investigations at the house since the Haunt Hunters days of the 1970s. I always bring along a board and make it available for people to use if they choose to. Just to make it interesting, I tracked down and purchased an antique board that was made in 1915. I figured that if we were going to use a Ouija board in the Lemp Mansion, we might as well use one that came from the era when the place was in its heyday. On this night, I put the Ouija board on a small table in the unfinished portion of the attic, which has since been remodeled into guest rooms, and placed some chairs around it to make it easier to use. The attic was quite a mess at that time. 
There were pieces of wood and old doors stacked around, and the air was thick with years of dust and grime. Previous visitors to the attic had left items behind, including a number of small candles that apparently had been set up for a seance of some sort. The candles had burned down to the wick, leaving small foil holders scattered all over the attic's main room. Throughout the evening, the separate groups took turns using the board during the time they were assigned to that section of the house. Nothing out of the ordinary took place as the evening went by, but people were intrigued with the idea of experimenting with the antique Ouija board. Just after midnight, I went up to the attic where Rex, Amanda, Darren, and Dave were trying out the board. I sat down in one of the chairs and watched as Darren and Amanda tried to coax messages from any spirits who might be hanging around by using the planchette. For the next 20 minutes or so, they had absolutely no luck. Their fingers were placed lightly on the planchette and they asked question after question, waiting to see if it moved. But nothing happened. Nothing at all. Finally, after another five minutes or so of frustration, Darren let out a sigh and suggested that someone else might want to give the board a try. Almost as soon as he spoke, all of us present heard the sound of something sliding across the floor. No one had been standing near it, but somehow one of the little candle holders had moved across the floor under its own power. The candle holder slid about ten feet from one side of the room to the other, passing directly beneath Darren's chair. The room was now so quiet that you could have heard the proverbial pin drop. What was that? Someone asked as we quickly deduced that it had been one of the candle holders, but we were unable to figure out just how it had moved. We spent the next hour or so waiting to see if anything else would happen, but nothing else occurred. I've never been able to come up with an explanation for how the candle holder moved other than to say that perhaps it was one of the spirits in the house. Were they trying to make themselves known to us and couldn't do it in any other way? Since that time, I have visited and stayed the night at the Lemp Mansion on many other occasions. On one visit, soon after the incident with the candle holder, I was photographing another session with the Ouija board in the attic. Three young men who had joined me that night were using the board while one of their fathers and I were standing in the doorway watching. As I photographed them, I noticed something very odd on the viewing screen of my camera. There was a fourth person in the room standing behind them. The photo showed a blur of movement as this person moved past the table. I immediately showed the photo to the man standing next to me and he agreed that no one else had been in the room. During another evening, I was joined by my friend John Winterbauer, who handles many events for my ghost tour companies. Everyone in our group had left for the night around 4.30 a.m., and John and I were going through the house, straightening chairs and making sure that everything was in order. The restaurant staff always left the dining rooms set up for the next day when they left at night, and occasionally our guests will move chairs or table items during the investigations. We had just finished in the dining room, Will Lemp's former office, when we heard the sound of breaking glass in the sunroom in the back of the house. Fearing that perhaps a glass had been left too close to the edge of the table and had fallen and broken on the tile floor, we went back to take a look. I turned on the lights, and we both looked around, but there was nothing to see. Nothing moved. No broken glass. Nothing at all. We had no idea where the sound could have come from, but wherever a glass had shattered, it had not been in our world. As Paul Pointer once said, those who come to this house are rarely ever disappointed, and I would have to agree. While not all of my stays at this old house have been eventful ones, at least when it comes to ghosts, I have to admit that the vivid sense of history that I've experienced when I'm here more than makes up for the lack of anything supernatural. If you're a ghost hunter or a history buff, then I encourage you to visit the mansion of the once mighty Lemp family. Their empire may have crumbled long ago, but there is much to see here among the ruins of yesteryear.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.